Good afternoon. Welcome to the third day afternoon session of the 7th International Conference of the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation, Southeast Asia. I am Ian Alfonso from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and a board member of the Philippine Historical Association. I am moderating the conference's panel seven with the topic Spanish Philippines. May I remind our audience here in the webinar that you may ask questions by pressing the raise hand button during the open forum. You may also type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box. For our speakers, each is given 20 minutes to present the remaining time will be used for the open forum. This session is also being streamed live on Facebook through the Facebook pages of the Philippine Historical Association, National Quincentennial Committee, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, DLSU, Cent DLSU Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, and the University of San Carlos Museum. For our first speaker, may I call on Ms. Ivan K. Bantige of the University of Santo Tomas, Manila, with, his, with her topic, The Local Comparisons and Global Connections of Trade in Manila Bay and its Water Tributaries from 1571 to 1644. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Ivan, can you maximize the PDF? Okay, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Again, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ms. Ivan KF Bantige, and my topic for today for the seventh conference of the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation in Southeast Asia in the 2020 Annual Conference of the Philippine Historical Association, the local comparison and global connection of trade in Manila Bay and its water tributaries from 1571 to 1644. The global nature of the local and global in these pre modern states Social political structure has long term implication for Manila. The Bay and River continue to serve as a significant transport material in the north and south banks. The increase in the number of cargo to meet the economic demands had also increased the barging and light reach industry. The barge entry or lighter number of dock workers and stevedores grew in number and dependent on the river as a livelihood source. As an effect, the labor force of the trade along the river, river banks was the arrival of the people from the rural area to look for work opportunities in big cities. It creates an additional part of the over, overgrown of the labor force along the river areas. The South China Sea offered a favorable condition in the development of long distance trade but the considerable differences in every state behavior, cultural differences, language, religion, and tradition, and the political economies shape the outcome of a global connection. The Philippines is located in the Southeast Asia, and the Chinese are called the Nanyang or Southern Ocean. 
and Indian Ocean merchants placed the island among the lands before the winds. The Philippine Islands, whose geographical location as an outlying of Southeast Asia, is blessed with hundreds of bays, which can be made into ports. Manila, the Philippines' capital on its Manila Bay on the banks of the Pasig River. Manila Estuary was a focal point of the estate co construction, hydrating up the rivers into the interior along the coast of Palayan and across the Sea of Tulubang and Mindoro. Like Cagayan and Pangasinan, this was the region of Asia. Manila itself is a mercy identified as on headland between the rivers and the sea. Manila, the place of the water lilies, was thriving marketplace in 1570 on the western shore of the Lazy Manila Bay. When the global trading in 1571 started, the significant inhabited continent started to share goods on an ongoing basis. The cornerstone of this system was the silver market. Since both the fiscal and monetary structures, they have move to a silver standard. China's silver demand grew to twice its order in the rest of the world. Mining profits have also supported Tokugawa, Japan, and the Spanish Empire profits that may not have existed in Christian Chinese absence. Europeans were physically present in modern, early modern Asia, but China's economic effect on Western lands was more, much more significant than any European influence in Asia. The Manila Bay a suitable route for Spain, China, and Japan, or the triangular trade did not just encourage a maritime trade, but also inspired a pre-modern search for identity. There were plazas and quarters for Chinese and Japanese merchants. Later, the Manila-based intercontinental work suggests the political and social organization. The Philippines' geographical location is considered the trading route for vessel from China that passes through the western coastline of the northern Luzon down to Manila Bay across Mindoro, straight into the Visayas via Cebu to the Sulu Archipelago and beyond into the Indo-Malaysia. Between 1570 and 1640, trade expanded not only because of the rivers, but also the interest in benefiting directly from the foreign commerce and through the passive, inter passive connection and interconnection. Spain, China, and Japan may describe territorial consoli consolidation, administrative centralization, cultural or ethnic integration, and commercial. The trading activity between Manila Bay and the upper river line settlements of the Pampanga and the Pasig and the mouth of the Rio Grande was focused on the trading activity throughout the Cagayan Isabela area. In the area of northern Luzon, the Rio Grande de Cagayan attracted the Japanese traders from the early times. The Spaniards attempted to establish a colony where the colonizers already built colonies like in Nueva Segovia in the present Lalo. The Japanese traders re-established a trading route in the Bay of Pangasinan in which the shores reached out to China based in political and commercial interaction as early as 1406. In Mindanao, the payments of the Delta of the Rio Grande de Cotabato, Cotobato, La Caldera, and those along Iligan Bay and the estuary of Butuan received an outpouring of trade from the interior. In Sulu, the same commerce existed between the coastal Samals and the interior Tausug of the Buranun, Baklaya, and Tagimaha. The major Philippine rivers drained into the Western Sea flow of the streams that moved goods from the eastern inter island to the coastal enterpots in the west. Moreover, the Manila Estuary was a focal point itself as a state construction subject for moving up the rivers into the interior. So in 1570, the maritime region crossroad identity where commercial access has stimulated regional networks encouraged the emergence of the Manila system. It stressed the joint force and the stable structures. The Manila system was characterized by a multi-layer connection based on the negotiation, protectionism, and free trade. 
At the end of the 16th century, Manila was ranked among the primary ports in Southeast Asia, was measured by the trade volume and the number of Asian ships falling at the port. Since 1570, Manila was the primary port in the Southeast Asia, which has the highest in the ranking of trade in the Asian ship cost in the harbor. The three pre-modern states considered commercial relations as a form of negotiation and stress the close link between diplomacy and trade. The decisive role of the diplomacy is further essential to the characteristic of the Manila system. The Japanese, Spanish, and the, even the Portuguese traders um, reduced silver production in the late Ming China. Currently, the role of the Japanese trade is to centralize the complex of the trade transaction. The Manila system was characterized by a multi-layer connection based on the um, based on the negotiation, a complex market practice with um, yes, between protectionism and free and free trade, the triangular circulation and the free trade triangular circulation or by multilateral. The number of parties in the pre-modern state of Ming China and later on the Tokugawa Japan and the Spanish Overseas Empire. Contacts are not conferred to Manila only. Ports as Ponzu in Fujian or China or Nagasaki in, in Japan and surrounding oceanic space in Mexico integrated into the network. Manila Center, the triangular trade between China, Japan, and Spain was embedded in the interplay of the trade and diplomacy and dependent on the whole range of contingent external factors casually described as foreign relations. Global monetary history provides a useful vantage from which to show linkage among the regions and an interconnected world economy. The first phase, the Japan cycle spanned in 1540s and the 1640s. 1640s and generated international trade. The second phase, the Mexican cycle, which covers the first half of the 18th century. We have two significant cycles. The, pro, the Japan, uh, again, so we have the Japan that's banned in 1540s to, six, uh, to 1640s. And a, sil, a second is a silver, silver phrase, the Mexican cycle that covers the first half of the 18th century. The analysis of these two silver cycles that I highly integrated to the global economy has existed since the 16th century. All the analysis of the world region are recognized the power integrated, interconnected economic, demographic, and ecological forces that have been operating at the global level for several centuries. The Chinese trade in the Southeast Asia. Um, when the Chinese start to see that the Southeast Asia during the, the 12th and the 13th century, the Chinese primarily conducted trade uh, at different areas. These entry pots, the Chinese imports, including earthenware, metallic manufacturers, textile, and tobacco, were sold as wholesale to the local rulers, and the number of merchants was charged with the retail and distribution. Chinese merchants were anything but massive carriers of zinc lured to Manila by precious materials. Manila was not only an option. Strong multi-ethnic networks have shaped the commercial nature of silk and spice trade in the South China Sea region for centuries. Alongside 15th century developments on the maritime silk road, Chinese trade become globally connected. Their trade ties spread the most corners of Southeast Asia and the country. The Chinese are also cited as excellent merchants and distributors of products. In the 17th and 18th centuries, beside the Chinese manufacturers manufactured by junk traders, the European also carried goods to the market. During the Song Yun dynasty, exchanges between the Philippines and China grew substantially, and junks visited Mindanao the Visayas, Luzon, Palawan, and Polilio Island in the northeastern of Luzon. Historical documents recorded that Fuj the Fujian, known as Min, was the most flourishing maritime cultural regions in ancient China. So, um, as a result, several Chinese traders came to Manila, um, according to the gathered data, 30 to 40 ships, to 100 to 300 tons every day trading season during the 1590s, 
And my 1690s, in combination, the numbers of around, uh, in the combination, the number of Chinese strong sent to Manila were licensed ones. And when the annual civil, silver imports are carried out between Manila and China, the silver imports to China for 1600 and the average of 46,600 kilograms of silver per year. 60% are from Japan and the remaining is from the Philippines. So to continue, the Yuga Manila navigation as a maritime connection between the Philippine island and the mainland of Eastern Asia grew up on the foundation of the East Ocean's prehistoric and historic heritage. As a result of, again, several Chinese traders come to Manila and the Yuga Manila navigation and sea routes, which connecting Manila with other neighboring countries like Macau, Siam, Borneo, and Nagasaki to Manila, the traded ceramic, silk, tea, tea, and other products from the mainland of Eastern Asia to Manila, then later transited to the America, America and Europe by the Galleon since the mid 16th century. The Yugan seaport has also been the entrance for the East Asia import um, from the America and Europe directly and directly by the Galleon trade, profoundly influencing Asian China's social cultural history. So the Japanese trade with Manila. Japan's entry into Southeast Asia is closely inter inter intertwined with China's economic history. When Japan's tributary trade relations with China ended in the 1530s, Japanese traders had to find new ways to participate in the maritime trade. Soon, piracy and smuggling were carried out by the merchant adventure, adventurers. Japan was a source of substantial uh, fractures of world silver production during the time. For instance, and the vast majority of Japanese silver was also exported to China. Local lords of the southern island, Kyushu, were the first to make adva advances in establishing regular ties with the Spanish in the Philippines, thus becoming the integrated part of Manila trade in the 1580s. Well, according to the Japanese historian, um, I hope that I can pronounce the name properly, Mahira Fusaki surveyed the weapon transport in the China Sea at the beginning of the 17th century. Weapons ranging from the traditional Japanese sword manufactured European style weapons. And the latter found a ready market in China. Despite of the main prohibition on purchasing firearms, they were likely to be carried back by Manila's agent exchanges. Japanese trade in Southeast Asia has emphasized that Japan adventurers frequently uh, sorry, go to the Cagayan in the Pangasinan. Region geographically perfectly located at the Japanese, even the Spaniards. An outpost of the Japanese in Cagayan on the northern edge of Luzon backs. However, with the illicit traders or even pirates, the Japanese could support Manila Spanish community. The nature of Japanese trade in Manila changed essentially with the introduction of the shogun's vermilion seal marketing started in 1601. The Hogawa Iyasu sent a letter to the governor of Manila introducing his wish for a regular business with Luzon and the, this institutionali institutionalization of foreign trade in the form of merchants operating under the Tokugawa license led to the Japanese ships increase with the emperor's seal, where welcome confirms the Tokugawa foreign trade regulation initially was a stabilizing effect on Manila. Okay. The inventory of the first vessel sent to Manila by Tokugawa I Iyasu shows that this trade pattern could be very lucrative for its it is listed in their extensive range of both symbolic gifts and variable goods, including 500 swords, different metals, and 10,500 blankets. Goods were like toilet mirrors and 30 golden folding screen give reason to believe that it was not standard commercial transaction. Apart from exchanging present, merchants and company company the delegation used the opportunity to barter with local leaders. The, um, now, Trans-Pacific Trade with Spain. With the establishment 
of Manila as a Spanish city in 1571, one of the most important economic links in the early modern world was established. Part of the business of the Mexican city merchants captured was the provision of goods to the government of Manila. The Spanish crown <clears throat> has supported its presence to the Philippines, including administrative staff, military, and priests. Most of the management of the Manila government was coordinated for this. Thus, through the new Spain government, the crown established contractual system that, that the private sector to supply food and other goods in the Philippines. Through this event, export from the Philippines during the Spanish commodities with them are the following beeswax, tortoise shell, little birds, nest, honey, uh, betel nut, seafood, pearl, coral, gold, mats, cotton, uh, food, and slaves. While for the imports, it consists of porcelain, iron centers, lead, tin, colored glass, beads, silk, iron needle. Bronze gong, small bells, and tree foods. So the annual imports of inventory in the Manila total uh, total nearer two mil uh, two mil uh, two hundred thousand pesos. The only real limit to the trade is that the ships permitted could not carry any more than cheaper Chinese wares were smuggled into per to Peru in differences of the royal suits. So to end, Spain was Spain was the only pre uh, the early modern European trading nation granting the Japanese direct access to their market. At the same time, they were the only first batch of the modern European trading nation that did not establish permanently or temporary factories in Japan or China. The Chinese inability to pull string in triangular trade by channeling gains made in Manila into their whole economy is as striking as the fact they, that they did not send their ships to the Americas, a bold step that the Japanese were keen to take as well as well as well as we, uh, we shall see thereafter. For the Japanese, the most significant challenge was a combination of the structural problems bad timing. Speaking of timing, it seems noteworthy that the peak of the Japanese trade in Manila was around 1607 and occurred several years before the rise of the Japanese maritime period here in Southeast Asia. Manila's multi-layer dynamics as a system, Manila did not connect as a core of the semi-dependent but it triggered as a la lasting global impact in various parts of the China Sea and Pacific. Manila's multi-layer dynamic as a system, Manila did not connect as a, again, as a core of semi-dependent, but triggered as a lasting global impact in various parts of China Sea and Pacific. So that is the end of my discussion for today. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Ms. Bantige. We're now, we will now proceed to our next speaker. He is from the University of the Philippines, Diliman History Department. Professor Nicholas Michael C. With his topic, Estas no Sedan, Indios, Indigenous Challenges to an Imperial, Imperial Cup on their Ambitions, 1600s to 1700s. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'd like to share a screen. So I think, uh, see, Ivan, um, you just have to off it and then I can go next. There we go. Okay. So, um, so first, I'd like to thank the conference organizers uh, for this opportunity to engage with other scholars in the field uh, in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. So um, here are my two titles. And I see I had to change course midstream. Originally, I was interested in um, indigenous, in the indigenous elites transformation from autonomous status to imperial allies during the early colonial period and then their transformation uh, from 
imperial allies to a bureaucracy servants uh, in the late colonial period. Now, I wanted to know if I could map that transformation. Unfortunately, uh, the answer for now is, is no, it's, it's very difficult to do that. But in the process of running my data, I did spot a pattern which I'd like to discuss today. And I've adjusted my research question um, to, to accommodate that. Uh, I presented an earlier version of this paper at the Philippine Studies Conference in July. And this later version today includes new data from Bolinao in Pangasinan and from Santo Tomas in Batangas, both from the 1680s. And you'll see later why this is important. Now, for this paper, I look at the parallel transformation discussed by the literature, which says that over time, indigenous elites consolidated political power at the local level. They also used colonial tools to do so, such as tactical marriages, spiritual kinship, resettlements, loss of property, loss of inheritance. While there's some dispute as to whether political consolidation was interrupted in the 19th century, for that earlier period from A to D, on, on the slide, A to D, um, the literature generally describes increasing consolidation. Now, what I'm arguing is that that consolidation increased um, more slowly and more late than we think. While I'm answering a concern that is uh, similar to the one addressed by the literature, due to the limitations of my data, I use a different approach. Whereas the literature talks about the 19th century, I work on the 17th. Uh, the literature is interested in families consolidating power, but I work on individuals. The literature is interested in village and municipal leaders. I work just on the municipal leaders. So I ask, um, did 17th century indigenous leaders as individuals perpetuate themselves in office? If yes, why? If no, why not? I asked that question for one case study, uh, the municipality of San Pablo in the province of Laguna, 1636 to 1700. Now, my main data set for answering this question, um, well, I have two data sets for this. The first is the baptismal register, which I have. Um, okay, I think there's a feedback, All right? Uh, the first data set, uh, the first data set is um, the baptismal registers, which I have thanks to the help of the Church of Latter-day Saints, especially Mr. Felvier Ordinario, who has been very helpful. This is a record of all baptisms in a given community per day. And collected uh, over time, it becomes a record of the baptisms across the centuries. Now, every entry on this register has the following data, and we're most interested in numbers two and three there. Um, red and blue over there. Now, um, my second data set is the Media Anata, which I have from the Archivo General de Indias, thanks to a different project, one that was spearheaded by uh, Dr. Maris Giocno. In the 1630s, the King of Spain began to charge people for a variety of government grants, including the acquisition of municipal offices. Now, these entries were recorded per year, and from what I've seen, payments were taken for about a century and a half. We're most interested in numbers one, three, and four over there. All right, so in this presentation, first I describe San Pablo's integration into the empire. Second, I describe my roster of municipal officials during this period. Third, I say that 13 names repeated often and it hints at the consolidation. Um, I caution though that only seven of these names are actually distinct individuals. I then show that these seven people held offices only sporadically. Fourth, I explain why. So this is the Philippines. San Pablo is an upland, uh, is an upland territory in Laguna between three mountains, Makiling, Malarayat, and Banahao. In the 17th century, the Pueblo also included all of what is today the independent municipality of Alaminos. And there are conflicting stories as to how San Pablo entered the Spanish empire in 1571. Now in both stories, the conquistador Juan de Salcedo and his subordinates met, um, met four warring gats, Gat Pangil, Gat Pulintan, Gat Sungayan, and Gat Salakab. They all lived in that area. In one version, the gats resisted the Spaniards and they were replaced. 
In another version, they convert and their paramount leader, he becomes uh, the municipal mayor. Now, whichever version you choose, the four warring communities are joined into one. With one set of municipal leaders. And this is their, uh, these are their municipal leaders in the 1600s. It look, it's 367 entries, so I only show snippets here. Uh, I compiled this list from three sources. The first is the transcription from Dr. Grace Concepcion, uh, which is based on the Laguna Media Anata. The, the second is my own um, collection of colony-wide Media Anata. And the third is uh, Juan Hernandez's list of Gobernador Silios based on local sources. There are a few caveats here, and if you'd like, uh, we can talk about them in the open forum. Um, for now, we'll, we'll move on. So on this chart, you see how many names held how many offices. For example, there were 44 names, which each showed up two times. The second row there, 44 names, two times. Um, in total, only 248 names held these 367 offices. Now our target is to find distinct people among them, not just the names that appear multiple times. So distinct people. The majority of people held municipal positions uh, for only one term. In other words, just one year. Only the 13 names on the left, that, that list over there at the left, only those 13 names show up in four or more terms of any office. But not all these names should be considered distinct people. On this chart on the right, you see baptismal names and how often they were given to children based on the period's baptismal register. So the name Juan de la Cruz, for instance, was given 39 times across roughly 2,000 cases. Some of the names on my list of 13 on the left are such common names that they were likely shared by multiple office holders. So I'm, I'm crossing them out. On this next chart, you see each name and the interval between their first year of office and their last year of office. For some of the names, this range is much too long. In the 1800s, the average, life, average male lifespan in the next door town of Nagarlan was 53 years old. Assuming that for our period, it was roughly the same, we need to eliminate a few more names. Diego Patel, for instance, is not likely to have been active for that long. That name was likely held by more than one office holder. All right, so let's focus on the seven names. Uh, let's focus on the seven names that do qualify. The positions available are in purple. Um, to explain, the gobernadores were municipal mayors. Uh, they're the old name for gobernador Silio. The tenientes were the right-hand men. The jueces, the cementeras and the palmas, were inspectors of the fields and the farms. Uh, and the palm trees. The mayordomo managed communal resources such as the Pueblo's lands and treasury, and the alguaciles were in charge of public security. And finally, the escribano there uh, is described. So I've charted each person, um, each of the seven people, I've charted uh, over time the positions that they held. Pedro Landecho, or in, for example, was Gobernador Silio, okay, for Pedro Landecho is that first row over there. Uh, he was a Gobernador Silio in 1663 and also in 1670. Now I have to make one caveat. I, I don't know what happens during those columns in gray. No medianatas were paid then, but if Juan Hernandez's list is to be believed, people were still taking office during these times. Um, for now, I just assume that the pattern found in general was replicated in those years in gray. The pattern I see is that there were very few people who actually held many terms of office. And even those people held these terms only non-consecutively. Now, this doesn't look to me like effective consolidation of power. And yet, 
For other times and other places, political leadership has proven to be desirable. For example, one account uh, about Ilocos in 1743 describes people buying votes and flying in voters to get the post of Gobernador Silio. Uh, that second case there, the second bullet point, is from Bawan in Batangas in 1838. That point um, highlights one politician's ambitions. So, I mean, if it was desirable elsewhere, what made San Pablo different? What made 17th century San Pablo different? In explaining this pattern, I must make a further caveat. I don't know how the Gobernador Silio's subordinates attained office. The Media Anata says that they were elected, but it doesn't say by who. The Gobernador Silio during this period was voted in by all adult male principalia, but it's not so clear that the uh, same rule applied to everyone. So for now, I don't speculate. The explanation for this pattern that I do hypothesize comes from uh, a religious investigation, um, which Mam Kamage would be familiar with since I've presented this to her elsewhere. Uh, it takes place next door in Santo Tomas in the 1680s. Essentially, this investigation discovers continuing animism. It accuses the parish priest of being negligent. The priest, they said, was more interested in cattle rather than catechism. Because of his neglect, people fled down to avoid colonial obligations. And the most important of these obligations was the Cortes de Maderas. This was when people were rounded up to go into the forest to chop wood and then bring that wood to shipyards to build the king's ships. According to a former mayor of Santo Tomas, this task could last up to 10 months. Now, during this religious investigation, San Pablo was implicated. Uh, the investigations in Santo Tomas next door, but San Pablo was implicated. Its priests in San Pablo had until recently also been raising cattle for sale in Manila. Uh, these were Augustinians. An investigation found animism there in three of its barrios, San Cristobal, Bulajo, and Palakpakin. And Bulajo here even had its own priestess. It's implied that San Pablo's Agustinian priests were similarly negligent. And this veiled accusation is supported by my data from the baptismal registers. The historian Bruce Cruikshank suggests that high, so we're, this is a little bit quantitative. Um, Bruce Cruikshank suggests that high levels of illegitimacy when found in the baptismal register is one indicator of a priest's ineffectiveness. Um, because the idea here is that priests, uh, even when you read Men Mentrida's uh, 1613 manual, they're asked to baptize children as soon as possible because if they don't baptize them and the children die in this era of high child mortality, uh, they're unable to go to heaven. So uh, priests should be baptizing immediately if uh, high... Uh... Oh, I skipped ahead. Okay. Uh, we're talking first about illegitimacy. We'll get to baptism, uh, interval between birth and baptism in a moment. Bruce Cruikshank says that high levels of illegitimacy when found at the baptismal register is one indicator of a priest's ineffectiveness because the priest uh, should know about the pairings of his flock. Meanwhile, both 17th century missionaries and modern historical demographers agree that the interval between the time a child is born and when it's baptized speaks about the quality of the record. One Dominican in Zambales in the 1680s complained that his predecessor was never around, leading many children uh, to be baptized too many days after birth. Now, as I said, this is a problem because uh, the era's child mortality is very high. If they die without being baptized and they don't go to heaven. So it was a concern for the Dominicans. This priest must be negligent, uh, the Dominican accused his uh, predecessor. Now, let's look at our figures. Looking at illegitimacy, Cruikshank says 16% illegitimacy is too high. He found that percentage for Franciscan, er for Franciscan areas in the Tayabas province and the Bicol region in 1842. San Pablo had 19%. In other words, one in five children were born to unwed parents. Now let's look at the uh, median interval between birth and baptism. In data for England at this time, just to have a reference point, uh, the, median of in, the median interval was eight days. In Zambales, uh, that Dominican who complained his predecessor was never around, 
he saw entries with a median of 15 days. To him, that was too many days. And now we look at San Pablo in 1679 and its median was also 15 days. In summary, looking at my header over there at the top, poor registers hinted at a negligent priest. A negligent priest meant inadequate support for Indio leaders. When their followers fled colonial obligations, the uh, municipal leaders were put on the spot. And remember these leaders were held responsible by the crown when their communities refused to comply with obligations. So there's a lot going on on this um, next slide here. Um, but you remember our subjects there on the left, uh, the, the image and our timeline there at the bottom and my research question there on the right. Okay, those are all the components. I suspect that San Pablo's 17th century leaders did not stay long in office uh, because they had been asked to combine four warring communities into one and then to help the colonial order extract labor from that new community. And they were asked, they were being asked to do so without the help of the colonial order's main agent, the parish priest. Um, uh, in the early years of the colonial order, the colonial authority depended on, the, depended on a fragile mental scaffolding uh, maintained by the missionary. Without him, this authority structure collapsed. In Zambales, uh, the Zambales that we keep mentioning, it turns out that people had likewise been disobeying the Roberto Darcilios. Uh, one of the missionaries implies it in his reports. Of course, there are other possibilities. And perhaps people just didn't feel the need to stay in office very long. Perhaps that one year you held office gave you enough prestige for the rest of your life. And we still see this today. Um, people, um, former generals still being called general, former presidents still being called presidents. Um, Santo Tomas next door, uh, actually had a, a similar revolving door of politics that you see in the media anata. And there was one man there who was called one of the most prominent people in town. And you know, he was just a two time gobernador Silio. That was enough to be the most prominent in town. There are also many other factors to consider when weighing the cost to benefits ratio of holding office. And as I continue to revise my essay, I hope to account for more of them. Um, for now, my hypothesis is that costs weighed very heavily. Returning to our timeline there at the bottom, one consolid, on con, sorry, <clears throat> the timeline is under consolidation of power by elites. Now I suspect that for this case study, entrenchment took place more slowly and later than we think. Now, my findings are provisional. My study is ongoing. I continue to clean my data and to look for uh, San Pablo sources. There are so many more questions to ask, uh, frankly. If your primary interest, for example, is in families consolidating power, families rather than individuals, I know my findings don't contribute much. However, if your interest is in early colonial individuals, their ambitions and their realities, hopefully my findings at least make these uh, follow-up questions a little bit more interesting. Okay, and um, these are my references. Okay. And, uh, all right. And uh, thank you to the following people for helping me to improve my presentation. And thank you to everyone for listening. If you have criticisms and suggestions, you know, I really welcome them. It would help me improve my work. So thank you. Thank you, Professor C. Hobie. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, the last speaker in this panel, is Mr. Mar uh, Dr. Marcelino M. Makapinlak from the De La Salle University History Department. And the title of his paper, Los Baños Laguna from the Spanish Contact to its Transformation as a Tribal Destination and a Healing Center, 1613 to 1898. Thank you, Ian. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank the International 
Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation, <clears throat> Southeast Asia, and the Philippine Historical Association for this great opportunity to share my uh, research, even though I, uh, I am no, an officer of uh, the other organization. Can you see my presentation? Ian, uh, nakikita na ba? Yes po, Doc Noy. Apo. Doc Noy, okay na po. Okay na. Okay. Okay. So, Doc Noy, okay na po bang maano siya? F5. Doc Noy, okay lang po bang full screen? Oo. Okay. Uh, okay na? <clears throat> yes po, Doc. Okay na po. Okay. So my presentation is divided into three parts. First, um, it describes how the town was founded. It elaborates how the hospital constructed by the Franciscan missionaries became the focal point in the political development of the town. The establishment of a hospital was a key factor in the settlement of more people in the area. It also illustrates the local growth of the place brought about by the influx of travelers, both local and foreign. Travelers were attracted by the natural beauty of Laguna Lake and Mount Makiling. People stricken with various illnesses came here for the therapeutic baths and the hospital of the Franciscans. Lastly, the paper also expounds on the significant developments in Los Baños during the 19th century, such as population growth, lingering uh, poverty, and lack of social order. Along with migration and progress in transportation, this resulted in various uh, responses from the people, including uh, banditry and participation in the Philippine Revolution of 1896. In the pre-colonial times, the natives enjoyed going to rivers and springs to take a bath. From newly born babies to women after childbirth, they took pleasure in bathing themselves not only for hygiene, but also for amusement. Father uh, Pedro Chirino he elaborates, from the time they are born, these islanders are brought up in the water. Consequently, both men and women swim like fishes, even from childhood, and have no need of bridges to pass over rivers. They bathe themselves at all hours for cleanliness and recreation. And even the women after childbirth do not refrain from the bath and children just born are bathed in the rivers and springs of cold water. Father Chirino further maintains that the natives also went to hot springs, trusting that these would cure them from various uh, ailments. He states in his account that, the, uh, that when he visited the area, the natives flocked to uh, the hot springs of Bae. Aside from the natives, some Spaniards, including priests, went here to bathe themselves and be healed from various uh, illnesses. Even those stricken with serious illnesses were brought to the place to bathe in the hot springs. Father Diego de Bobadilla, one of the early Spanish uh, missionaries sent to the Philippines, also observed how the natives enjoyed bathing. According to him, they bathe also during their sicknesses and have for that purpose springs of hot water, especially at the shore of Laguna de Bae. 
The place described by Father Cherino and uh, fa uh, Father Bobadilla was uh, Los Banos, which was then part of the town of Bae. Los Banos was still then uh, known then as Mainit or uh, Hot. This ascertains how the natives valued the characteristics of the place. Joaquin Martinez de Suniga uh, explains that the place was called as such on account of the hot springs occurring uh, there. So here we have uh, a map of uh, Laguna and its uh, surrounding provinces uh, okay, where uh, the location of Los Banos is highlighted. So Los Banos is located somewhere in the western part of the province. It is bounded on the north by uh, the lake, okay, on the south by uh, Mount Makiling, uh, on the west by Calamba, and on the east by uh, Bae. The Spaniards established Bae as a municipality and a parish on uh, April 30, 1578. As a parish, it was named San Nicolas de Tolentino. Uh, it was administered by the Augustinians led by Father Juan Gallegos. In 1590, Franciscan missionaries learned about the healing powers of the hot springs of the town when Father Pedro Bautista, uh, OFM, uh, later known as the Martyr Saint of Japan, passed by the area. San Pedro Bautista examined the waters of the hot springs and confirmed its uh, th uh, therapeutic qualities. Without much ado, the Franciscans uh, built public baths in the area. Although made from light materials, such as cogon and bamboo, these drew large numbers of people to the area. Father Bautista's dream of building a hospital in the area was realized through the efforts of Father Diego de Santa Maria, OFM. Uh, Father Santa Maria petitioned the authorities to allow the Franciscans to build the hospital in Mainit. Their petition was approved on July 29, 1602 by the Cabildo of the Holy Church of Manila. Uh, of Manila. Uh, Governor General Pedro de Acuña confirmed the approval and uh, named the establishment as the Hospital de Nuestra Señora de las Aguas Santas de Mainit. It was uh, placed under the supervision of the uh, Franciscans. Father Santa Maria was tasked to manage the hospital. The hospital was uh, later known as Hospital Real de los Baños, which became its uh, popular name. Uh, and finally, Los Baños, no, which became its popular name. The same name later applied to the entire town where the hospital was located. Okay, so uh, the hospital and the property were eventually taken over by the Catalan uh, clan uh, who would turn it into a resort which uh, drew visitors who knew about the healing qualities of its uh, waters. The resort fell into hard times as estate issues among the heirs of the property and because of competition from uh, upstart uh, water theme parks of another generation spring around the hot springs. Los Baños became a pueblo or town when a parish was built here in 1613. On September 17 of that year, Governor General Luis Villa formally turned over to the Franciscans the jurisdiction over the town. Los Baños was established as a separate parish with the Inmaculada Concepcion de Aguasantas as its patroness. Meanwhile, the municipal government of Los Baños was established in 1615. Okay. Juan Castañeda was its first gober uh, gobernadorcillo. The municipal building was erected near the port area. Okay. During that time, the municipal, uh, uh, the principal mode of transportation uh, to and from other towns was through the Laguna Lake. Water-based uh, vehicles docked in the port located in the northern part of the town. With the assistance of the Spanish colonial government, Los Baños became a favorite travel destination and healing center. Due to its uh, scenic spots, such as the Laguna Lake and Mount Makiling, and its proximity to Manila, 
a large number of travelers came to the place to relax and enjoy uh, its pristine beauty. Its hot springs, famous uh, for its uh, therapeutic qualities, uh, enticed some people with illnesses to come to the place. The impressions of some of the foreign travelers about Los Banos were recorded in a number of accounts. One of those who were mesmerized by its unspoiled beauty was uh, J. Deman, a traveler from Belgium. According to him, lighted by a, by a brilliant moon, the evening is superb and the panorama spread out before us, ravishing. All is silence. To the right of us, the still waters of the lake mirroring the light of the moon. Facing us from far away are huge rocks with bizarre forms that give evidence of volcanic upheav uh, upheavals. The dark greenery of the tall palms, coconut trees, banana plants, etc. contrasts sharply with the brilliant light of the moon. What poetry is in this admirable land? Mount Makiling was a favorite destination of travelers, especially those who took pleasure in hunting due to its abundance in wild animals, including birds. Due to his lengthy stay in the Philippines, Paul P. de la Hironier uh, has served as a guide for his fellow foreigners uh, in doing tours around Los Banos, especially in the mountains. He recounts, there also on the hill, we were sure to meet with good and plentiful sport, wild pigeons and beautiful doves, perched upon majestic trees, mistrustful of their doom, allowed our sportsmen to approach very near, and they never returned from the baths without having bagged plenty of them. Upon our appointed days of relaxation from labor, we would go into the neighboring woods and wage war on the monkeys, our harvest's uh, greatest enemies. As soon as a little dog purposely brought up to this mode of warfare, warned, that, uh, warned us by his barkings that uh, uh, marauders were in sight, we repaired to the spot and then the firing was open. So here we see uh, De La Hironier in uh, Filipino hunting costume. Meanwhile, the hospital built in Los Banos by the Franciscans was well patronized. It was not only the native Filipinos who came here to get cured of various ailments. Even Spaniards and other foreigners were convinced of the therapeutic properties of the waters of the hot springs. In August 1621, uh, then Manila Archbishop Father Miguel Garcia Serrano reported to the King of Spain that bathing in the hot springs was beneficial for those suffering from colds and swelling of some parts of the body. He also reported that natives Spaniards and other foreigners, both male and female, went to the hospital in Los Banos to recuperate from various illnesses. Aside from the aforementioned, uh, aforementioned uh, common illnesses, it was also believed that the hot springs of Los Banos could cure serious diseases. In his report about the activities of his religious order, Father Maldonado de Puga mentioned that six soldiers were brought to the hospital in Los Banos. He stressed that the hospital was built due to the properties of the waters in the area to cure various ailments, including venereal diseases. Martinez de Suniga described the source of the hot springs and uh, how hot the waters were. He recounts, wells of boiling water are found all over this mountain, but what makes or forms the hot baths is a, uh, is a small creek that flows through a man-made stone canal which crosses the convent premises. As the water flows down, it loses some of its heat due to, the exposure, uh, due to exposure to the wind, but not so much. It reaches the lagoon hot enough to scald the hand. At the place where the creek starts, the water is sufficiently hot enough to cook an egg in four or five minutes. <laughs> okay, a dog which accidentally fell into it came out <laughs> divested out of every hair. Okay. Now, since its establishment in 1602, the hospital thrived continuously. This was brought about by the following factors. The natives donated some of their lands to the hospital, aid from the government, and 
fundraising initiatives of the missionaries, the Franciscans, who administered it. Travelers continued flocking to the hospital in the middle of the 19th century. However, the hospital has been dilapidated uh, by that time. Charles Wilkes, an American traveler who arrived here in 1842, noticed a huge volume of chicken feathers next to one of the main hot springs. This was because the spring was already being utilized to dress chicken for cooking. Years passed and the conditions of the springs remained in their poor state. The Austrian traveler Karl von uh, Scherzer mentioned in his account that in spite of its dilapidated condition, the structure was still used for bathing. However, he noted that the hot springs were used more often for cooking. He recounts, although at present in a very forlorn and dilapidated condition, there is still in existence quite near to the edge of the lake an apartment enclosed within a wall within which there uh, boils up a considerable depth of uh, that a, hot, a spring of hot water of a temperature of 186 degrees Fahrenheit, which is occasionally used both by natives and foreigners as a vapor bath, although these uh, thermae are more used to scald poultry than for their original purpose of curing disease. The population of Los Banos grew rapidly in the 19th century. In 1818, there were only uh, 921 residents. The number grew rapidly in the next few decades. In 1846, it considerably increased to 1,600. The figure dramatically swelled to 2,578 in 1891. Improvements in the transportation system contributed uh, to the rapid increase in the population of the town. In the beginning of the 19th century, a road network was built in Laguna, encompassing the towns from Los Baños to Santa Cruz. It was constructed near the co uh, coastal portion of the Laguna Lake. In 1849, a road uh, passing through the sides of the hills of Mount Makiling from Los Baños uh, and Calamba. Uh, Professor Rina Bongkokan and the late uh, uh, Dwight Jestro pointed out no, in their book that the development of the road system increased the contact between these towns and that communication between towns also increasingly uh, relied on the road network, especially after floods uh, displaced many communities from their original lakeshore sites to areas further inland. Towards the end of the 19th century, banditry became widespread in the Tagalog provinces, including Laguna. Uh, Dr. Isagani Medina argued that this was a result of uh, extreme poverty. During this period, Mount Makiling was notorious as a base of operations of tulisanes or bandits. To secure the patients of the hospital in uh, Los Baños, then Alcalde Mayor of Laguna, Leopoldo Molano, uh, recommended the deployment of members of the Guardia Civil in the area. In September and October of 1896, Antonino Guevara went around uh, various parts of Laguna to convince some residents to join the revolutionary organization Katipunan. Guevara was the head of Matatag, one of the organization's branches. In his memoirs, he stated that he was able to recruit men from the towns of San Pedro to Nasan, Binyang, Cabuyao, Santa Cruz, Bae, and Los Baños. He designated Alejandro Kendayan as their leader. Okay. On January 5, 1898, Guevara visited Apolinario Mabini in Malate to convince him to go to Los Baños to uh, recuperate from polio. He recounts, although I had no wish to know uh, Senor Mabini, I went to Malate and called on him. I gave him to understand that it was not best for him to remain there, and if he wished, uh, and if he wished, he could take the La Laguna boat and uh, move to Los Baños, on the ground that he had to take uh, the cure of the waters there. I said that we should see uh, Senor De Gracias Reyes, whom I had appointed as head of Los Baños, so that he would see to uh, what was needed. 
That same year, the Filipino Revolutionary Forces in Laguna established the bases of operations in Mount Makiling. From there, they initiated attacks against the Spanish uh, soldiers. Headed by Pasiano Rizal and Miguel Malvar, offensive were, uh, were carried out in the towns of Bae, Calawan, San Pablo, Alaminos, and Los Baños. Pasiano Rizal also led in building an arsenal in the Tuntungin Mountain in Los Baños. From there, they distributed arms to the revolutionary troops. By June 1898, the vicinity of Santa Cruz Laguna was the only remaining portion of the province under Spanish control. In the first few days of this month, Filipino forces cut the telegraph line connecting Santa Cruz and Manila. Spanish sovereignty over Los Baños and the rest of Laguna was put to an end by August 30, 1898. On that day, the papers on the surrender of the Spanish troops to the Filipino forces led by Pasiano Rizal were signed. The following day, the Spaniards, including the friars, left the provincial uh, capital. News of the surrender of the Spaniards uh, reached Aguinaldo through a letter from Pasiano Rizal. Ipinagbibigay alam ko po sa inyong kapangyarihan na ngayong fecha at oras na las 5 ng hapon ay nawawagayway na sa kasa gobyerno nitong lawiga ng ating bandila Ayon sa pagsusulit nitong plaza ng ating mga kaaway na Kastila na sumuko din eh, alinsunod sa kapitulasyon ng ikatatlumpu ng buwan ng Agostong nakalipas. Okay. So to sum up, so this paper has identified and explained the significant events in Los Banos that contributed to, the, uh, to its growth from a mere portion of the town of Bae, Laguna to its establishment as a separate municipality. Even before the arrival of the Spanish colonizers, people have been flocking to Los Baños. They came here not only to enjoy bathing in its hot springs, but to recuperate from various illnesses, trusting in the healing properties of these waters. In recognition of the characteristic of the place, they called it Mainit. With the encouragement of the Spaniards, Los Baños became a recuperative center. Upon reaching the place, they examined the therapeutic properties of the waters of the hot springs originating from Mount Makiling. After validating the healing qualities of this water, they built a hospital for the treatment of men and women, whether natives or foreigners. They initially called it Hospital de Nuestra Señora de las Aguas Santas de Mainit. It was later changed to Hospital Real de los Baños. After some time, it was just called Los Baños, the name which uh, stuck up to, this, uh, up, up to the present time. The Spaniards also supported the development of Los Baños as a travel destination. The place was frequented by travelers who visited the hospital. Uh, the scenic spots in the area, such as uh, the Laguna Lake and Mount Makiling, well, uh, were also major attractions. Travelers were charmed by the natural beauty of the town. The construction of the hospital by the Spaniards further attracted more people to come to Los Baños. Many of them settled down in this place. Due to its growing population, a new parish was established, which was separate from the parish of San Nicolas de Tolentino in Bae in 1613. Los Baños was also established as a separate municipality in 1615. In the 19th century, the colonial government made some improvements in the transportation system in the town. Roads passing through Los Baños were constructed. This further contributed to the increase in its population. The paper also examined the responses of the people of Los Baños to the challenges of the environment and colonialism. Some residents accommodated the Spanish colonizers, but the majority resisted colonialism. The larger seg uh, segment of the population remained impoverished during the Spanish colonial period. Although Los Baños became a travel destination and a healing center, agriculture and industry in the town did not improve during this period. A large number of residents were recruited to join the revolutionary movement, which liberated the country from foreign rule. Mount Makiling played a crucial role in the operations of the Filipino revolutionaries. In spite of the difficulties they had to endure during this, uh, their uh, stay in the mountains, they established uh, their bases of operations in the area to initiate attacks against the colonizers. Their sacrifices paid off when the town and the entire country was finally liberated from the Spanish colonial government. Maraming salamat po. Dr. Noy, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, we are, we still have 
21 minutes before we finish this panel. So may I invite our audience, our audience to kindly uh, type your questions in our chat box. And don't forget to mention the name of the speaker to whom you address your question. While we're while we're waiting for 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 the for the questions, I would like to to to, to, to acknowledge the, the 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 papers of of our speakers. I know so for the interest of our foreign 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 uh, audience here in the webinar, our speakers presented the socioeconomic developments in the immediate provinces around Manila. So those are the activities from this from, from 1571 when the Spaniards conquered Manila and then until and spilled over until 1898 through Dr. Noy's paper. He, he, he even mentioned the Philippine Revolution, the part of the Philippine Revolution in Los Paños. Okay. We're still we're still uh, we still have twenty minutes before we conclude the panel. You know, this panel. So kindly type your questions or your comments, reactions, or even uh, what they call this an an addition to to what our speakers to the uh, to the to the to the details our speakers presented. Uh, Ian, I have a question. I am just yes, a yes, Doctor Kamagay. As again, it's a turn on. Uh, I'm happy that um, PNHS is with us, uh, uh, and uh, so don't be apologetic, uh, Noi, that you are part of this conference. PNHS is open to everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, huh? Now, um, I, I have a um, uh, question for uh, uh, Toby. Toby, no? Toby. Toby. You know, it's really very, I, I can imagine how, how difficult it is to reconstruct no? uh, the past, uh, particularly using um, documents, no? uh, because, I mean, um, to, to uh, you know reconstruct the population of the Philippines during the early part and but we are very very fortunate that the friars did the work of statistics no <laughs> because they were always uh, uh, entering us in their books whether the ba libro de bautismos the matrimonios or the the futo. so they they masipag no they were very very uh, uh, serious and uh, with the, their task. Now it's so difficult. Why? Why is there a discrepancy in terms of birth and the baptism? No, which you said was reflective of uh, the friar not doing his uh, work. No, well, uh, it, there there are many things that can come out of it. One I, I suspect, no, these are all speculations. Um, one is that um, most of these babies, let's say, are uh, delivered by traditional midwives. So it would be very, very difficult, or not even very, very difficult, but uh, it would take time for these babies delivered by the helot to be formally registered in the church records. Uh, so that's uh, one factor, but um, it's good that the some of the parish records have a list of illegitimate ch children, no, babies. But I think there's also that, um, in a sense, a lot of underreporting uh, existing because of the fact that uh, traditional uh, helots were the ones, you know, uh, delivering babies. You know? So 
it really becomes um, um, a bit really difficult, but you have to consider that kind of a situation. No? The second point, I, as I am interested also in the municipal, uh, the families and the, the ones coming out to become governor seniors. I don't know whether the 17th or 18th century, it was required that a candidate for the governor Silio is supposed to present his, um, to declare his uh, real estate or let's say his properties. I, I came across documents like that, that so-and-so candidate has a house made out of wood, has one uh, cattle, they, they, they have to present that. Uh, it's like a bond, I think. Huh? Because once they uh, fall short in the collection of tribute, the shortfall will have to come from their pockets. That's why I also suspect, I'm not uh, being sure with this, that finally it did not become a very attractive position. And people or the elite will try to, you know, uh, probably at the start, they were so interested to convert the position but later on, because of this uh, situation where they had to always answer for shortfalls in the tribute, they didn't find it an, an asset anymore. It became a liability. I mean, that's what I suspect because there will be records of uh, positions of Governor Brasilio in the 19th century that were vacant. No, no. So, uh, probably because the, the position no longer was that attractive. Also, but you're doing good work, uh, Toby, uh, go on. Uh, many questions will have to be answered, but don't be overwhelmed. Uh, take things bit by bit and you'll be able to reconstruct you know, uh, something out of your data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamagai. Do you, do, do you want to... Just to say something or react, uh, Hobi. Um, so uh, it's a very, very fascinating point. Um, first, uh, a tangent comment. Of, uh, I mean, my comment will be tangent. It's about the helot. Uh, that didn't occur to me. And at the same time, um, the this town, Santo Tomas, uh, which is next to San Pablo, they listed their gods, and one of the gods was uh, La, La Campina, who was uh, the uh, Paratera Vieja, so the old midwife, or the Hilot, she, she, Hilotera, she was called the Hilotera, so it's interesting. The, the second thing um, is regarding uh, the declaration of holdings. Uh, I've seen this for the 1800s, and for the 1800s there exists this uh, debate uh, between whether or not the positions were desirable. I think the two sides of the debate are Norman Owen versus Len May, and then um, others who fall within those camps. Uh, but now that you mention it, I didn't think I, I should be looking for that for the 1600s. I, it didn't occur to me, but that would be a very good resource. You're right, that would be a very good resource to show that, yes, it would be a burden, that, yes, uh, it wasn't just uh, uh, that they're having to cover for the rest of the community was institutionalized. Thank you for the lead. That's, that's very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Hobi. I think uh, we have two questions, or I think three or oh, now. We have three questions here in the chat box. So the first question is addressed to Professor C or oh, Hobi. You, you now have a question. Did you get to see the Spanish records that mention the presence of Babaylans in San Pablo and, Lag and Laguna? Well, not only San Pablo, but the entire Laguna province. Uh, yes. And uh, for, for the listeners, you know, they're, they're available on Paris. So if you go on the website and you type Idolatrias San Pablo, they will show up. And they're written in Old Spanish, but it takes a little time. You'll be able to read them. Uh, and they're very fascinating. Okay. Thank you, Obi. The next question is addressed to Ms. Bantige. May we know possible sources for the Japan and Mexican trade cycles? Uh, thank you. Because of the difficulty of the language, I use secretary's process. 
uh, I use the work of uh, I use the work of Chunin Mu, Yunga Manila Navigation, Developer Trading, the Archaeology of Manila Currency Force and Early Maritime Global Definition. I also use the work of um, Chin Ke Yung Tang, Expanding Possibilities, Revisiting the Min Yun, Yung Trade Enterprises on the China Coast and in Nanya during the 18th to the mid 19th centuries. And for and for the other sources for, is that Mexico and my record? Yes, you mentioned I, Mexico. Yeah. yeah, for the Mexico, I also use the work of uh, Jose L. Gas Thomas, Atlantic Pearl in the Manila Galleon Circulation, Market and Consumption of Asian Goods in the Spanish Empire. We also have the work of Colin Gonzalez. Um, it can be seen in the Revisita de Historia, Economic Journal of Iberia and Latin American Economics. So those are some of the books that I use for to look at the development or let's say the trade between the Philippines and the China and the Philippines. Thank you. Ms. Buntige, there is another question addressed to you. Uh, it's from an anonymous attendee. Did the Spaniards force the Chinese and the Japanese to conduct their trade in designated ports that are con that were considered as their strongholds, such as Manila and Iloilo. Hello, Miss Miss Ivan. Yes, hello. Thank you. Um, so thank you both for the question. So did the Spaniards support the Chinese and the Japanese to conduct their trade in designing ports? Um, I don't have. I, I, um, as for the question, I can address the question for now. But based on my readings, because the uh, because the start of the trade, the trading in the Philippines are from the the Chinese and then um what the Chinese and from the Japanese, I I can answer if there is a force between them. But I that is a good point for me to look on, on and to gather. But because of maybe if I will visit in the timeline, if I will visit in, in the timeline, I think um, the trade between them is um, continuous even the time in the Spanish period. Okay, thank you, Ms. Bantige. For the last question, uh, addressed to Hobie again. Um, your research has implied that Spanish control that, that the Spaniards control the Spanish control over San Pablo has been shaky, which inhibited the consolidation of power by municipal officials. However, that would left that would have left a power vacuum. Have there ever been records of people consolidating power through other means, such as becoming a sort of neo-datu or strongman warlord? To fill that vacuum in. Uh, okay, um, for other for it's an interesting question, and uh, for other places we've got um, the the idea of a paramount datu, right? Uh, which uh, essentially uh, um, was a datu among datus. Now, in, for San Pablo, we have the beginnings of that with got. I, I forget which of the four guts, but I think it's Gat Pangil who, who is at the head, but it's a little bit uh, shaky. Now, um, as to whether there was a power vacuum in San Pablo though, well, I mean, even with Gat Pangil, the, these communities uh, were, in the, in, were independent. So uh, the power vacuum assumes a larger community that breaks up and leaves an empty space, a vacancy. But I don't think that there, that was the case necessarily. I don't think there's necessarily a larger structure that dissolved. They had always been, as far as I know, they had always been small in that particular area. But I am studying um, Pangasinan uh, up north and uh, the Malong Revolt and his use of the of the a colonial authority on the one hand, the Maestri, the Campo and its staff, and his position as Anakbanwa combining that to uh, become a paramount datu within the colonial age 
I think there you can see it happening for the, the 1600s and that's another story altogether and it's also interesting. Thank you, Hovi. I would like to acknowledge um, the uh, uh, comment from Dr. Ahmad Murad Merikan of Malaysia. Uh, he said, in British records on Penang, there is also mention of Manila man from Luzon coming to Penang to trade around 1780s. And then from MJ Datiles, I think this is, uh, this is, this is his, her or his question is addressed to to our to, uh, to our three speakers. Maybe we can we can ask Dr. Noy, you know, so uh, to answer this. Um, uh, thank you all for wonderful presentations. The conference aims to transcend orthodox Eurocentric views and incorporate it into under-recognized indigenous sources and narratives. Based on your own experiences and expertise, what do you feel has been the biggest challenge to finding and utilizing sources that offer indigenous perspec pers perspectives in your research? Uh, Dr. Noy? Yeah, uh, definitely the biggest challenge would be uh, finding sources that were written by uh, the natives themselves. Okay. But uh, uh, just recently, no, um, Professor R uh, Ricky Jose of uh, the UST Archives you know, uh, has been uh, uh, able to find records no, uh, about uh, <clears throat> records written, no, written by, uh, by the natives. Uh, these were written even up to the 16th and the, the 17th centuries, no? written in uh, actually in uh, the native script no? in uh, Baybayin. Okay. Um, however, the problem is uh, how much has been uh, left no? by, uh, uh, has been left of the native uh, accounts. Um, but of course, uh, in the last century, um, Dr. William Henry Scott has already uh, uh, tackled this. No? Even though there is a scarcity of uh, sources um, written by, uh, by the natives, okay, we can still uh, uh, somehow look at the perspective of the natives by looking at the cracks, no? the cracks in uh, the so-called uh, parchment uh, curtain, okay, by uh, reading between the lines, no, probably. Okay, thank you, Doctor Noy. Okay, um, so I would like, uh, in on behalf of the Philippine Historical Association and our partners in this conference, thank you very much to our three speakers, uh, Doctor Noy, Miss Bantige, and Mister C. So um, we will now, I think we will have a short, am I right, Dr. Santiago, Professor Shaw? Yes. Are we taking this uh, uh, spare time to have a photo of? Yes. Okay. So kindly. So trustees, please open your camera for the annual trustees photo. We would like to trust these only. As past president, we would like to invite, if he is okay with it, Dr. Ambe Tocampo. Mani, Kalairo. Yes, uh, wala po siya sa room. Ah, wala. Okay. Sige. Sir Fernie, are you taking it? I've taken the shot. Thank you so much. Salamat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shaw, Dr. Fernie. Uh, may I now transfer the the floor <laughs> to our next moderator. I think the moder our moderator is Dr. Mark Inigo Tallara for the 
panel eight uh, session about Christianity in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Ian. So good afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, Mark Inigo M. Taliara. You can call me Mark. I am from De La Salle University in Manila and uh, also an affiliate of the uh, DLSU Search. I will be your moderator for this uh, panel and also the second speaker. Just a gentle reminder, immediately after the second presentation, we will have the discussion in open forum. So please type in your comments or questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, or you can even uh, click the raise hand if you have further clarifications. So for our first speaker, for this panel is uh, Dr. Palmo R. Ia from De La Salle University Das Marinas in the Philippines. His presentation is entitled in nomine patris el filie espiritu sancti ang katolikong ebanghelisasyon sa Pilipinas sa panahon ng serko ni Bilkasyon. Prop Ias, pwede na po kayo mag-start. Salamat po. Sir, nakikita na ba yung aking slide? Opo. Kamusta ang audio ko? Maliwanag po. Okay, salamat. <laughs> Hindi ko makita yung ano. Ayan. Slide show. Malaki na bang slide? Hindi pa. Hindi pa po. Hindi pa. Okay. Ayan na po. Okay. Magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Ipagpaumanin kung sa wikang Pilipino ko ilalahad ang aking papel o pananaliksik na pinamagatan ko kitong in nomine patris et fili et, et, et spiritus sancti ang katolikong ebanghelisasyon katolikong ebanghelisasyon sa uh, Pilipinas na panahon ng circumnavigasyon ang pinakalayunin nito ay upang siyasatin at suriin na ang ginamit na paraan ng ng ekspedisyong Magallanes sa kanilang ginawang pangangaral ng ibanghelyo sa mga katutubong Pilipino at kung paano hinikayat kotan kot ng una ang huli o yung mga katutubo na tanggapin ang kanilang bagong pananampalataya O sa pagsisiyasat at pagsusuri, aking ginamit ang aklat ni Antonio Pigafetta na translate o sinalin sa wikang Ingles ni James Alexander Robertson. Iyong primo, primo viagyo interno al mundo na sa wikang Ingles ay first voyage around the world or sa ngayon, makikita natin sa internet ang Magellan's Voyage Around the World. No? Okay. Ang balangkas ng aking uh, papel ay hinati ko sa apat. Bibigyan ko muna ng maiksing kaligirang pangkasaysayan ang pagpunta nila Magallanes dito sa 
ating kapuluan para madali nating maunawaan ang dynamics no ng kanilang ginawang pag-ibang July sa atin no tapos uh, bibigyan ko rin ng uh, tinatawag na counting o pahapyaw na pagkilatis kung bakit si Fernando Magallanes at hindi si Padre Valderrama ang naging misyonerong uh, conquistador no at titingnan din natin ang mga pamamaraang ginamit nila Magallanes sa kanilang pag helio no at ang aking nakita ay eh, meron siyang apat na pamamaraang ginamit no una iyong tinatawag na patakarang pangaakit para may makinig no o kaya mapansin yung kanilang yung kanilang uh, hanay sa pagbabahagi ng reliyon. At sunod, yung paggamit ng rhetorical na mga pangako, no? At susundan ito ng paggamit din ng simbolo ng cross tapos yung paggawa nila ng bautismo o pagbibinyag na siyang lumalabas na Uh, pagkukontrol nila na no? sa pagitan ng paglilibet at pagkatapos niyan ay uh, bibigyan natin ng counting conclusion yung ating paksa na no? so dapat mapansin natin na noong siglo labing lima at labing anim ay nagkaroon ng tinatawag na mga monarkong katoliko ang Espanya sa katauhan nila Haring Ferdinand at saka uh, Reina Isabela no? at ang dalawang monarko na yan ay nagkaisang dibdib o nag-asawa noong bandang 1469 at pagkatapos ng sampung taon ay, uh, ay nag-asawa sila at yung kanilang mga Karian, no? Castile at Aragon ay nagsanib at sa panahon na yan, no? uh, 1492, no? bahagi pa rin ng huling, huling bahagi ng ikalabing limang siglo, ay naging makapangyarihan at tinuturing na yung panahong 1492 na siyang katapusan ng tinatawag na rekonkwista no? na nakuha nila ang bahagi ng Granada, naging makapangyarihan. Yun yung panahon na sila ay naging uh, yun yung panahon ng golden age na uh, Espanya sa pamagitan ng kanilang pananakop na no? at batid natin na yung dalawang yan ay merong mga pinanghawakang prinsipyo tulad ni Reina Isabel sa kanya ang kanyang pagiging pinuno ng Espanya ay parang merong divine calling na siya yung magpapalaganap ng katolisismo sa buong mundo sa makatwid, uh, nag, nag-jive o kaya yung dalawang monarko nga niyan, kasi yung isa naman, yung lalaki, si Ferdinand, eh sanay yan sa political maneuvering. No? Kasi yung kanyang background sa Italia, eh nakita niya na uh, kailangan ng taktikang politika para maging makapangyari yan. At yun nga pagiging national monarchy ay isang ano yun, isang uh, isang ha step para maging makapangyarihan ang Espanya ngayon no so nagkaisa ng mga karyang ito at 1492 batid natin na uh, ang sa pamagitan ni Christopher Columbus ang Espanya ay naging namayagpag sa Amerika at tuloy-tuloy na yon no tuloy-tuloy na yon sa tinatawag nating uh, uh, siglo Uh, golden age ng Amerika. Paki ano nga nito. So, ano ba ang pinakabatayan ng expedition Magallanes sa kanilang pagpunta rito? O kaya ano ang batayan ng mga explorador sa kanilang uh, pananakop o eksplorasyon ng mga lupain? Unang-una, lagyan natin ng 
ng religious na aspeto kasi itong aking paksa ay nasa larang ng reliyon. No? Unang-una, nagkaroon ng paligsahan o kaya naguunahan yung dalawang bansa, Portugal at Espanya sa pananakop o sa pagtuklas ng mga lupain, eh ang dalawang bansa o imperyo na yan o kaharian, sabi natin kaharian, ay mga katoliko. No? At yamang mga katoliko yan, eh kailangan hindi sila mag-away. Kaya nag nagkaroon ng intervention dyan yung kapapahan. So para maging malinaw ang tinatawag na eksplorasyon ng dalawang nauna na mga na mga mananakop no sa Europa sa panahong ito ay eh, nagkaroon ng intercetera divina o kaya yung yung bula ng papa ang pinakasikat diyan ay yung 1493 yung intercetera divina na talagang nilagyan ng ng parang parametro o kaya hinati ang mundo sa dalawang bahagi na ito ang bahagi na ito ay sasakupin ng Espanya at ito naman sa bahagi na ito ay sasakupi ng Portugal. At kitang-kita no, sa loob mismo ng dokumento na itong intercetera ay nagbigay ng kapangyarihan sa hari o sa mga konkistador na ano, pwede nilang nakawin, plunder. No? Yung mga kayamanan ng mga tao o ng mga katutubo doon sa bagong mundo o kaya saan mang lupa o teritoryo na kanilang masasakop. Bakit? Kasi sila ay mga pagano. So yung pananaw na pwedeng nakawan sila kasi pagano. At dapat, yamang sila ay pagano. So ang pagano, di, sa demonyo yan, no? o mga hindi nakakilala sa Diyos, kailangan sila ay turuan ng Kristyanismo. Ipakilala si Kristo o kaya yung Diyos ng mga Katoliko. Okay? So kailangan yan. Nasa plano yan. No? At kapag kinakailangan, patayin sila kung lumalaban para sa kaligtasan na no? so yung yung ganung ideya ng pananakop na no? lagyan natin ng tinatawag na parang may divine right ang mga conquistador ngayon okay ang sunod diyan sa religious na entidad ay yung patronato real yung patronato real kasunduan niya ng mga monarkong katoliko at papa sa Roma na yung pananakop o kaya pagtutuklas ng mga teritoryo ay ano kasama diyan ang basbas ng simbahan na no? so nagkasundo sila manakop at ipalaganap ang Kristiyanismo sa buong daigdig so ang punto na yan eh malinaw sa imprehan sa mga ex, sa mga conquistador lalo na kay Magallanes o Ferdinand Magellan. Isa pa na dapat makita natin sa punto ng mga prinsipyong pinanghawakan ng mga konkistador kasama siyempre ang hari ay yung tinatawag na kapitulasyon, no? Kapitulasyon. Ano itong kapitulasyon? Ito yung dokumento o kaya kasunduan ng mga konkistador at ng hari na ng Espanya na Exactly. Na also, sa kanilang sa kanilang gagawing pananakop ay merong nakalaang oh may naririnig ako may nakalaang mga lupain kayamanan para sa sa kaharian at meron ding mapapakinabangan o kaya mapapasakamay na mga pabuya para sa conquistador. Ah, uh, batid natin sa record na tinatawag yang encomienda, pero maraming anyo yan, no? Pwedeng lupain ang pabuya na encomienda, pwede rin yung mga yaman, no? O kaya yung mga nakukurakot, mag-share-share ang kaharian at ang conquistador. Pero dapat makita natin na yang yang dokumento o kaya kasunduan ng kapitulasyo nagmula pa yan doon mismo sa reconquista. Kasi yung reconquista, no? ay uh, walong daang halos walong daang taon yun na ano na laban ng mga Kristiyanong Espanyol para mapalayas nila ang mga Moro sa kanilang bansa ay nung 
kasagsagan at namayani o na nagtagumpay sila noong 1492. Ang lakas ngayon nung ano, nung kasunduan na yan ng conquistador at ng hari at ginamit yung kapitulat yun ngayon doon na mismo sa panahon ng eksplorasyon kasama tayo diyan no hindi lang sa Amerika kundi sa atin sa Asia no so iyan ay ginamit na pundasyon o kaya mga prinsipyo ni Magellan Magellanis no built in sa kaisipan niya yan so ito ngayon ang aking panghahawakan intercetera ng papa patronatorial ng ng hari at ng ng papa at ngayon kapitulasyon so an an laki o kaya matindi yung kanyang ano yung kanyang uh, ano ngayon pag-asam na say karapat dapat na uh, manakop o kaya kung merong lalaban sa kanya ay eh, eh, may karapatan siyang patayin ang sinumang lumaban sa ngala ng mga mga dokumento na yan no kaya mat- makita natin na Si Ferdinand Magellan, hindi si Father Valdema, Valderrama talagang front na naging mga ngaral. Uh, Pasabi natin na ibang hilista. Kaya makikita ito sa ano eh, sa mga pahayag na katulad niyan sa page 139 hanggang 141 ng ginamit kong aklat, no? The captain told them that God made the sky. So siyang nagpapakilala sa Diyos, ang creator, no? At siyang nagpapakilala sa utos ng Diyos na kapag nilabag o hindi sinunod ang mga ito eh ano sila mapapahamak ang mga katutubo no so siya, siya yung yung vanguard talagang nangaral si si Father Valderrama ay officiate lang nag-officiate lang sa misa okay so yun yung kanyang ano ngayon yung kanyang papel hindi lang siya basta conquistador ibanghilista rin siya no nagsasalita siya ng tungkol sa sa Diyos, no? Ngayon, batid natin na mahirapan si Magellan at ang mga Espanyol, no? Sa kanilang paghihimok o panghihikayat kasi mayroong communication gap, yung wika. Hindi sapat si Enrique de Malaca, no? Hindi sapat si Enrique de Malaca sa aking pagsusuri sa dokumento, hindi sapat si Enrique Malaca bilang translator or interpreter para ma- maipaunawa ang ang ibang helio sa mga katutubo, no? At hindi rin siyempre sapat ang sign language. So kailangan gumawa ng gimmick sila Magellan para matipon ang mga tao at makinig sa kanila. So isa sa mga napansin ko sa dokumento, yung pangaakit. Alam na natin yung sanduguan ni Magellan, Kalaraha, Humabon, Kulambo at iba pang mga 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 lead, mga leader ng kapuluan sa Bisaya, no? At yung kanilang pagkipagkaibigan din kasi uh, kita natin na nagkaroon ng parang commercial transaction sila doon. No? Pero napansin ko na para maakit, yung tinatawag nating patakaran ng pangaakit, para maakit ni Magallanes ang, uh, ang mga tao, ay nagsagawa siya ng, ay nagsagawa siya ng, ano, ng fencing tournament. No? fencing tournament pinili niya yung kanyang mga mauhusay na sundalo na, na may mga suot na balute no at sinabi niya magpakitang gilas kayo sa mga tao ito ha ah, pakita niyo yung galing natin sa paglaban at kung paano tayo mawak ng sandata at kung paano tayo hindi natatabla ng mga sandata so yung fencing tournament ngayon opo nagulat nagulat at naakit ang mga tao no dinagsayo ng mga tao nung marami ng tao ay di dala-dala na ngayon yung cross yan no so yung yung pangaakit ay isa yan sa strategy na ginawa ni ni Bajelan no? para ma, mag-obserba o kaya mapansin sila ng mga tao kaya yung yung mga sumunod pa no o ito na ngayon ng mga tao uh, na tutuwa na sa kanila maging yung tinatawag nating uh, uh, pagbinyag no yung misa pala yung misa na ginawa sa limis, Limasawa ay eh, grandios yun no napaka napakagalante no so kitang-kita natin na na doon sa paggawa ng misa abang tinataas ni Valderrama yung Ochas no Corpus Christi no Iminanduhan ni Magellan yung kanyang mga cruise ano na magpaputok 
at kailangang maging ano yun, maging uh, umbaga uh, dapat magkasabay no itataas yung ochas yung body of Christ puputok yung magpaputok sila so gulat ng ng mga tao wow grabe ang kanilang misa ay ganito talagang ano bongga no bongga so ginamit yung ganong paraan para maakit ang mga katutubo no kagilagilalas kagilagilalas yung misa no nakahanda ang barko para paputukin sa tamang panahon ang kanyon at mismo na no? eh yung ganong pangaakit ay eh, nagpatuloy yon nagpatuloy at alam na alam ni o kitang kita ng mga Espanyol na tuwang-tuwa ang mga tao kaya sa mga susunod pang pangaakit na no? pagkatapos niyan eto na ngayon sa panahon ng bautismo na no? ni Raho Mabo ng Sibo ginamit ang magarbong presentasyon ng katolisismo noong bininyagan nila si Raho Mabon na sa Cebu. Ang nakikita niyo yung kwadradong plataporma may palamuti yan. Ang sabi niya no, no, yan ay nilagyan ng mga palamuti, tela, bulaklak at mga palma. At pagkatapos, no, kinaumagahan kasi diyan sa binyagan Sabado yan, ang sabi ni Magella, no, huwag kayong magulat. Kinaumagahan, meron kaming gagawing ritual ng pasabog kasi parang piyesta sa kanila at pagdiriwang yun dahil ang hari ng ng Cebu ay naging Kristiyano nagpabinyag no huwag kayong magulat kaya muli no muli pinaputok ang kanyo ng barko pinaputok uli no so eh wala namang ganyan pa ang ating maninuno meron tayong mga bangkang malalaki yung balanghay malaki din yun pero wala tayong paputok o kaya yung long barrel yung puputok na 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 barrel no gun no long gun okay so sa mga tweet ay meron pang dapat gawin si Magallanes para maakit niya ang mga katutubo at ano ito yung rhetorical na pangako rhetorical na pangako iksabihin mabulaklak na pangako ang daming pinangako ng mga Espanyol na ito sa magitan ng Bagalyani sa mga katutubo. Na kapag sila ay makinig maging Kristiyano, eh, uh, lima o yung hari, no? bibigyan niya siya ng armor, ng baluti. No? Eh, walang ganyan ang ating mga bagani o warrior. Walang baluti. No? So, ano yan? Parang regalo. No? Tapos, siniguro niya na pag naging Kristiyano kayo, eh, hindi na kayo babang Uh, babag uh, bababagabagin guguluhin ng mga masasamang espiritu ng mga demonyo no o may ganyan siyang pinangako no? at kayo ay magkakaroon ng kapayapaan no? Ka- walang hanggang kapayapaan na yan ay gagawin namin sa inyo at siyempre protection mula sa hari ng Espanya ngayon, ikaw na pinuno, kausap sa halimbawa sila Raho Mabon, ikaw na pinuno, magiging pinakamakapangyarang pinuno dito sa inyong rehiyon. Ha? Ang hindi sumunod sa iyo, eh, ano, bibigyan natin ng leksyon. No? Paluluhurin natin sa iyo. Ikaw ang pinuno dito kasi ikaw ay tumanggap ng kristyanismo. Eh, batid naman natin na si Humabon at sila pula po noon, eh, magkatunggali, no? nag-aawa yan. So, ito ngayon, si Mumabon, uy, pagkakataon ko ito ah. May backup ako ah. At makapangyarihan. Ha, ah, patay ka lapula po. Ha, ah, pag hindi ka pa namin ngayon mapasuko. So, ano din, no? Gumamit din ng ano. Gamitan, yung prinsipyo ng gamitan. So, okay na. Kristiyano na ako. Ayan, so tuwang-tuwa ngayon sila. Prop Ian, five minutes po. Ah, five minutes na lang. Nako po. So, yung cross, yung cross, dapat ba batid natin niya yung cross ay... May simbolo yan sa mga Kristiyano, lalo na at cross ay kaligtasan niya, no? Si Kristo yan, ikaligtasan. So inilagay nila yan sa mga visible na lugar. Halimbawa, sa tuktok ng burol ng Limasawa at sa gitna mismo ng bayan ng Cebu para mapansin, no? At kailangan lumuhod o kaya sambahin niya ng mga katutubo. Katumbas niyan sa pagsamba at paggalang sa sa cross ay kailangan sunugin nila ang kanilang mga Anito. So, pansinin natin yung ideya ng pagtanggap sa Kristiyano ay kapalit pala ng pagtanggal ng ating 
o ng, ng sinaunang paniniwala ng ating mga ninono. So ano yun? Parang exchange, no? Anyway, limang minuto. So yung, yung pang-apat na nakita ko, yung bautismo mismo, na ito na yung ultimatum na pag nabautismuhan, ay ano, babaguhin ang pangalan. Siyempre, Kristiyano. At alam natin, si Humabon ay si Carlos na yun. No? Si, yung asawa ni Humabon naging Juan at ang iba pang mga prinsepa, mga prins, prinsesa o kaya reyna dyan sa, sa Cebu ay naging pangalan ng nobilidad. Na sa tingin ni Magella, no? yan ay you know, pagbabago na ng identity ng mga katutubo. Yung pagpapalit kasi ng pangalan sa biblical tradisyon na sa biblical tradition yan ay domination control no kasi si sa genesis si si adan nung ginawang master ng sandaigdigan ay eh, pinangalanan niya binigyan siya ng pangalanan ang lahat ng mga nilalang so batid ni Magellan pag pinangalanan niyan ay eh, nagpapasakop yan no sila yung superior yung binigyan ng pangalan o bininyagan na bago na hindi na pagano hindi na animismo eh ano, Kristiyano na at nagpapasakop na, no? So 'yan yung 'yan yung pinapakita nung apat na na patakaran na ginamit para para makatutubo ay tumanggap ng Kristiyano. So bilang konklusyon, nakita natin na uh, gumala umindak o gumalaw si Magallanes ayon sa diwa nung binanggit ko, intercetera ng Papa, patronatorial, Papa at Hari ng Espanya at yung kapitulasyon sa pagdadala ng Katolisismo sa Pilipinas daw. No? circumnavigation. Sa mga tweet, andyan yung prinsipyo na may karapatan siya. 100% yung kanyang yung karapatan na yun sa kanyang akala, no? At ngayon yung pagtanggap ng mga katutubo sa sa bagong reliyon, ay eh, akala ng mga kolonisador ay eh, ano yun, pagtanggap na yung pagpapabinyag at pagpapasakop ay eh, pagtanggap na ng katolisismo. Pero alam natin na hindi yun naintindihan talaga ng mga katutubo, no? At meron pang meron pang mababasa na Akala ko ba kayo, sabi ni Magellan, akala ko ba kayo, Kristiyano, na bakit din niyo sinunog yung mga yung mga anito niyo? Actually, hindi nila sinunog lahat ng ng anito. Kahit na nagsunog sila, pero hindi na sinunog. At nang matalo nga si Magellan sa labanan sa Mactan, bumalik sa Espanya yung mga natira, eh bumalik din sa sa dati nilang paniniwala, yung mga Cebuano. Kasi hindi nila nga na, natanggap yung Kristiyanismo mo batay sa totoong kahulugan talaga na Kristiyanismo. So, yun yung ano ko na tinanggap sa tinanggap ng mga katutubo ang Katolisismo. Walong daang katutubo na kalagay diyan sa Record of Pigafetta. Tinanggap nila yon sa pamantayan nila, hindi sa pamantayan ng mga Espanyol. Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat po Professor Iga for give, uh, enlightening us on the role of the circle of navigation in the transmission and transplantation of uh, Christianity in the Philippines. Let me, uh, okay. Okay, let me just uh, share my slide. Uh, Okay, let me begin. Uh, my paper, my study is about uh, uh, Catholicism in uh, the Philippines, highlighting the events and objects on the popular devotion to Nuestro Padre Jesus Nazareno or NPJN of Quiapo, popularly known as Señor Nazareno. This study also calls for more scholarly attention on the historical and religious connection between the Philippines and Mexico. That through them, we can better appreciate the Latin American dimension of Filipino Catholicism. This study is both historical and ethnographic, using sources from the archives and the research materials I collected in the Philippines, in the US, Mexico, and Spain from uh, 2013 and uh, some insights from 2020, the current year. This project is actually part of my bigger project on Catholicism in the Philippines and in Southeast Asia. Although the devotion to Senor Nazareno is central to the arguments of this uh, paper, 
the discussion takes a broader consideration of Quiapo, a district of Manila, as a shared space for performing panata or sacred vow. This analytical step is consistent with the hypothesis that a consideration of performing devotional practices, particularly to Christ, is crucial to the understanding of the historical and religious connection and how popular devotion has changed in the Philippines. So in 2018, approximately 1.2 million, other records say 2.5, devotees flocked Luneta Park and the streets of Quiapo District in Manila, joining the 22 hours long procession for what is considered still the longest religious procession in the history of the Catholic Church in the Philippines. The Traslacion or the January 9 procession of the Black Nazarene of Quiapo is an event also reenacting the official transfer of the image from Bagumbayan, which is an area near to the present day Luneta Park and Intramuros, transferred to Quiapo Church in 1787 or 1767. I will explain later, no? The procession is one of the biggest Christocentric devotions in the Philippines, but also known for its very frightening and controllable nature, uh, social cultural identity, and even a rite of passage for many of the members of the Hijos del Nazareno, also of the Mama Masan, or the rope bearers and the plain devotees. What is the historical connection of the Philippines and Mexico? How this relationship manifested in contemporary places and religious practices? So this set of questions introduces the main argument of this study. The Tridentine Catholicism reached the Philippines through the Manila Acapulco Galleon trade and the influences can be seen in the popular religious practices in Quiapo. So Manila, as a space for performing panata, which is distinctive in showing interconnection with external influences and the devotees in a world self pool. So what most Filipinos regard as religious influences directly from Spain may in fact have more influences from Mexico. This research project uses also an unconventional approach considering both Southeast Asia and Latin American dimension of studying the Philippines. From touching the sacred image of Senor Nazareno during the procession or pulling you know, the 50 meter long ropes, many of the uh, devotees, it is an act of faith and a way of performing their panata. But for HDN or Hijos del Nazareno members, it is their ultimate task to protect the image from danger. It is an act they need to perform, not just for religious blessing, but also for the earn, no? to earn the highest praise and acceptance of the senior members of the HDN or the Hijos del Nazareno hierarchy. And of course, of the Senor Nazareno. Quickly, I just want to show you a table, table one. So as of 2015, there are six brotherhoods or HDN officially recognized in Quiapo. No? HDN are recognized in different balangays of chapters. No? So for those uh, not member of the HDN, they are either plain devotee or uh, mamamasan. No? But some mamamasan uh, eventually, you know, become member of uh, HDN. So this picture, I know this is also circulating around the social media. No? Uh, compared to uh, the videos or the pictures that we uh, can see you know, uh, during the translation in January 9, uh, this uh, painting of Honorata Lozano, 1847, uh, 
you can see the procession in an orderly manner. No? You can see even women lining up, patiently waiting no? for the image to pass and enter the church. So for, I want to show you a, 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 another table, no? table number two, the translation in numbers. Uh, this table is the uh, latest one no? because it keeps on changing. I keep on changing the data because of the inconsistency uh, of uh, the numbers no? from various sources. So particularly the crowd estimate. So uh, if you uh, uh, take a look no? on the years, no? as a quick footnote, in 2008, uh, Quiapo Church management decided that the procession should start in Quiapo. No? Although the tradition of having the translation only started, no? this is a part of my argument, in 20, uh, uh, 26, 27, no? the year that uh, Quiapo celebrated the 400 years of arrival of the image from Mexico to Manila. Uh, 1606, no? and then they decided to uh, return it again no? in 2008 in the streets of Quiapo. So uh, there is no existing data yet that uh, uh, if uh, uh, there are events no? held or a procession held from Luneta to Quiapo because from the longest period of the time before 2007, all the procession only held in the streets of Quiapo, not in Luneta. So starting 2009, they continued until last year, no? this year. But uh, uh, officially, a few weeks ago, they already announced the cancellation of the 2021 translation due to COVID-19. So place and space in the study of religion and history is still evolving. For Michel Foucault, space is a site of struggle. So the study of place and space can be found also in the works of Michel de Tou and Henry de Febre. While de Tou, Le Febre, and Foucault recognize the authority and power of religious institution, they also recognize the discourses on the historical production and shaping of place and space. Buildings and streets, like for example, has been built, rebuilt, and redesigned a few times. It is also the sum of the people who live and work in the buildings and who walk in the streets. Just like buildings and streets, road, is also what Lepebre referred to as conceived space. Roads or streets can be transformed every year, either by processions, carnivals, or even uh, selected cultural events. Buildings, streets, roads, and small corners are lived spaces, just like in Quiapo, one in which the dominant order of the neighborhood is temporarily overturned by community activities as well as by collective sentiment. So in this study, performing panata is used as a metaphor for both gratitude and reciprocity or the reciprocal process happening because the Señor Nazareno granted the devotees wishes, petitions or prayers or in return as a form of panata Devotees are joining the procession every year to return the favor or utang na loob or debt of gratitude. So performing panata, either personal or inherited, occupy a singular importance among the young and older devotees in Quiapo. Why? They view panata as a sacred promise from a death that is a death of gratitude that must be fulfilled to return the favor, whether their petitions, 
prayers or wishes are granted or not. What is important for many of them is for their panata to be fulfilled, either as a lifetime commitment or can be passed on to the next generation or any member of the extended family or even community. Performing panata, either personal inherited, you know, is part of their commitment, no? Why they are attending the yearly translation, no? As I mentioned in the earlier slides, the presence of the senor or the sacred object is an important aspect to understand what is happening in Quiapo. Sacred objects, particularly the image of Senor, is crucial to the understanding of the religious devotion and motivation of the devotees. No? Many of the devotees want to bring home also, not just their own stories or about the procession or about the translation, but also physical objects like handkerchiefs, towels, and other religious items that have touched the Senor Nazareno or being blessed by the holy water. For many of the devotees, these are not ordinary objects, not ephemeral, but sacred objects that they can touch or kiss no, or keep or keep and place them in their family altars or home altars, no? So that the blessings received by the objects and by them can be transferred or shared to the whole family or community. The presence of sodalities or confraternities and other forms of brotherhood or lay association is also an important aspect of uh, the transmission and the continuation of the devotional practices in Quiapo. Many of the confraternities in the Philippines had undergone modification over time. Uh, this project focuses only on the Quiapo-based uh, Brotherhood of HDN. No? The discussion on the confraternities or lay association addresses the importance of lay actors to the growth and the development of the devotion, no? particularly in Quiapo. Although many of the HDM members clearly understand the official Catholic teachings and the devotion to Christ, but their understanding has some elements which are distinctly uh, local or even uh, Filipino. Most contemporary studies on Southeast Asia and Latin America particularly uh, Philippine-Mexican relation, have concentrated on economic expansion, political relationship, and even security ar architecture. No? It is almost that the religious and historical connection between the Philippines and Mexico have become erased from the social memory and only resurface in a very limited and superficial way. Given that uh, there is a very long historical tradition between the Philippines and Mexico. It is also the aim of this paper, of this study, this study to highlight the role of the Manila Galleon no? to the transmission of the religious ideas in the Philippines from the perspective in addition to the religious tradition originated from Spain. For 250 years, the Galleon brought to Manila people from different parts of Latin America. Mexico become an important source of administrative manpower and, been, and become a financial center for both the royal government and for various religious order across the Atlantic and the Pacific. Mexico was also a very important ecclesiastical and religious hub for missionaries destined to Asia and other parts of South Americas. As missionaries bound for this area open had to pass through Mexico. So through this investigation of the Manila Galleon, 
and the people-to-people -people exchanges, the discussion is an examination of how missionaries were able to access Asia, particularly the Philippines, and the apparatus and method they used to expand the missionary activities. And by examining the uh, movements of the different missionaries and the pious people and their religious ideas within the framework of religious and historical connection between the Philippines and Mexico, I would like to add no, uh, to my arguments that religious images either miraculously instructed or commissioned by an authority, these images and performing the devotion to them is a way of communicating ideas, historical connection and religious belief. And that miracle stories are part of the complexity attributed to popular devotion, particularly to Christ or to other saints. Some of the recent studies on popular devotion in Latin America and including the Philippines no, focused mainly on the apparitions of the Virgin Mary rather than those of Christ. A surprising fact considering Christ's centrality to the Catholic Church teaching, Christocentric devotion and the images of Christ are rarely investigated in terms of their relationship to earlier Spanish culture or in terms of their distinctiveness as an original image and devotion in Latin America and in the Philippines. Even within the larger category of miraculous uh, crucifixes, in general, there is a little scholarship and research on black Christs, even though this image is also popular throughout the Spanish colonial period and remain up to the present day. As a passenger ship, the composition of the people aboard the galleons varied according to direction. So in July 1605, 14 missionaries from the Order of Augustinian Recoleto, Recoletos boarded a ship in Cadiz in southern Spain, sailing to Mexico. So they boarded the Galeon Espiritu Santo from the port of Acapulco. No? After staying in Mexico City, they crossed the Pacific. Only 13 missionaries reached the Philippines in 1606. They landed in Cebu first on May 12, and reached the shore of Manila on May 31st. They brought with them an image of Christ without mentioning yet the official title. No? So Quiapo is one of the 16 district of the city of Manila. No? For many of the devotees, the Quiapo church, uh, countless stories of rising from the ruins because of fire, because of uh, uh, the uprising and earthquakes of the year 1645 and 1860, or even demolished, no? partially demolished and rebuilt in 1863. And again, uh, uh, slightly damaged, no? if not uh, uh, destroyed no? during World War II. No? Uh, so we can see in the picture here are more than historical facts no, for many of the uh, devotees. They consider that miracles no, that was later attributed to the miraculous doing of the Black Christ Nazarene. So Keapu was burned and destroyed many times, but the image remained intact. So this is a picture of the uh, evolution of the andas or the carriage that uh, uh, used during the procession. No? If the picture is true on the left before World War II, this is the original andas no? of the Nazareno in Intramuros. No? But the post-World War II or the current one is now used in Chiapa with uh, a different or modified uh, decoration. So the sense of space and sense of space in Quiapo. So in Quiapo, a Quiapo has a shared as a shared space for performing panata has two distinct yet interconnected aspects. So place refers to the material setting of social relations. Here, the historical analysis 
of the physical site of Quiapo has not been straightforward because the location of Quiapo Church has been at risk of both man-made and natural disasters no? like fires and earthquakes, as well as historical moments like wars and change of government. Furthermore, in each of these events, the church has been built and rebuilt numerous times. So the sense of place refers to the emotional attachment of the people to the place. In Quiapo, the series of unfortunate events, as well as the mirac miracle stories connected to the place played an important role in the historical past of the church. It is through this historical past and the continuous presence of the objects no, and the practices, one can truly understand the religious reality in Kiapo. The idea of the sense of space, which is connected to the sense of place, is where the devotees construct their sense of self or sarile. Here, the sense of sarile is connected to how The, now the, uh, the devotees narrate their religious experience uh, to others. So in Kiabo, the stories were told and shared in different ways. How the community performed the religious devotion, how they welcomed the devotees, how they introduced their devotion to non-Catholics or first-timers, and how the different historical accounts are incorporated in the formation of the devotee's sense of space. Let me proceed to the conclusion. So the staying power of many of the devotees in Kiapu appears to prevail even when I ask them about their wishes or petition not being granted. No? The, a large number of devotees considered it as a trial or pagsubok, no? that one should wait and to bear what is it or locally known as magtiis or tiis uh, from the Tatagalog word, no? which means to suffer, to endure, or to wait. No? For many devotees, magtiis means that it is always the will of the Black Christ or the Nazareno to grant the pet their petition or not because God knows what is best for the devotees. Or it is the, ti the timing is not right, that it is not for the good of the devotee. It, it, it may also be due to their sinfulness, therefore requiring them to do uh, more penance. No? So Kiapo Church was burned many times, no? but it, the most important treasure remained intact. The life-size image of the Black Christ Nazarene survived miraculously during those troubled times. The stories of the burning, construction, and reconstruction of the church, the miracle stories, the tales of miraculous survival, as well as the episodes of the transferring and returning of this image no, may in fact be some of the most significant events in the history of Quiapo in the religious formation and transformation of the devotees. Thank you. Okay. All right, let me just check the Q&A and the chat box. Uh, let me see. All right. So while uh, I'm checking the chat box, would you like to uh, type in you know, your questions or comments to uh, both of us, uh, Professor Ia and me? Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, very. In your paper is very interesting. Um, uh, it's a very interesting documentation of a 
the sense a place of pilgrimage, something like that. But how would you explain uh, why uh, in the vicinity of uh, the space of Quiapo Church, you have the presence of um, uh, people who at Manghuhula, for example, the one who will give you forecast your future. And how would you explain why also in that space you have um, women who would sell uh, medicinal plants or something like that? So in, a, in other words, uh, we see the space shared by what is considered sacred and what is considered profane. So in other words, a question, how, 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 how would you explain the presence of those two uh, sharing the same space, the manghuhula and the, um, uh, the women who sell medicinal plants or herbal plants? which actually are um, also, they sell also what we consider as abortifacients, no? Uh, yung panpalaglag, uh, so to speak, uh, in our uh, Tagalog language. Thank you po, ma'am, no, for your question. No? So, although I try to uh, uh, incorporate no, the insights, no? I, uh, I I collected from my interview our respondents, no, uh, who are not uh, who are not actually devotees or actually in the vicinity of uh, of Quiapo. So uh, first, boy, you know, yung the idea of hope, no. Uh, let's see, no, kung magplay around po dun sa insights, no. Number two, po is uh, uh, we if, if we if we are familiar with the uh, uh, Kiapo as a place, it's a it's a commercial space, din po, no? or or for transaction, no? of uh, different things, no. You can you, you can uh, have uh, uh, other things, no. You can uh, 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 buy in Kiapo, no? all sorts of things, no. Uh, throughout my uh, field work in the years uh, twenty. Uh, 13 to 2015 although compared po dun sa siguro ba previous years no according to some of my respondents mas konti na daw po yung uh, who, who are selling aborti patient no yung mga although there's still medicinal plants that they are selling pero because it's a commercial area and used to be you know uh, very popular you know not only for uh, this kind of medicine but other things, no, connected to uh, ika nga po e eh, alternative form of uh, relief, no, including mga anting-anting po, no, although it might not be directly connected to that, but this uh, also kind of form of uh, of relieving some pain, no, or relieving something on your body, no. Uh, that's one po, no, for commercial po, and then also in relation to uh, uh, looking for things that it, you can easily, you know, relieve pain on your body, no? And then dun po sa uh, fortune teller, uh, it could be also, no, connected po dun sa hope, no? <laughs> because uh, I think the devotees also is uh, entering the church for, for, or for asking for something and uh, hoping for the Senor Nazareno to grant them, no? And uh, of course, if uh, uh, as a plan B, no, kung titingin nyo po no, for uh, what uh, my young uh, uh, respondents are telling me, uh, some of them are also, you know, uh, asking for the fortune teller, no, to uh, tell what would be their future, especially for the young respondents. Uh, now, who is praying for better work, uh, better paying job, but at the same time, po, asking for the fortune teller kung ano po yung magiging trabaho nila. Now, there's, there's this uh, perhaps uh, not uh, implicit connection no? on, on the idea of hope. Po. I, I like your uh, answer. I think, yeah, that you have hit the nail on the head. It's really hope no? uh, that... Uh, 
things, uh, whether they uh, ask the Senor Nazareno, whether they ask the fortune teller, magugula, or yung nagtitinda ng mga gamot, it's really, I think, hope, no? which they are asking for. So uh, if that is the, the main concept, you are able to you know, uh, remove the, uh, the divide between what is sacred and profane, I think. No? OK, thank you for your answer. Thank you, Paul. Uh, sorry, I have a difficulty of uh, looking at the Q&A box. So perhaps uh, uh, one of you can assist me if there is a question addressed to uh, uh, Professor I Iya. It seems that I cannot scroll down the Q&A box and also the chat box. Yeah. You cannot... You cannot uh, look at the chat box. Okay, okay. let me try to screen. Okay. I can read it. I can okay, read, read as a Professor Cha. Okay, sige. Uh, this is a question from Christopher Esquejo. Uh, to the second speaker and moderator of the current panel, have you identified elements of both Filipino and Mexican indigenous religiosity that are still persisting in the Capo Church and the annual translation of the Black Nazarene? Some anthropologists assert that the Capo Church is a good example or case study of folk. Catholicism in the Philippines. Thank you so much. So regarding the Philippine Mexican, uh, I'm in my paper actually my uh, my um, my study uh, does not include directly you know, the uh, the similarity of the Mexican and the Filipino. Uh, way of uh, performing devotion no i am uh, actually explaining that there could be you know elements no or influences particularly on the framework of the tridentine catholicism so i actually i share this to uh, another panel perhaps i can get the comments from the people here no uh, because the the kind of catholicism that was during the Pilagalio is the time that uh, the Tridentine no? Catholicism started to be implemented. So remember, you know, the, the historical events happening in Europe that time, you know, the rise of the uh, Protestants and the other problems of the church. So this is one of that. No? So what the kind of, so what kind of uh, Tridentine Catholicism introduced in Mexico, no? So we properly know Baroque, no? Baroque. So is there such a kind of Baroque Mexican Catholicism? Pinagkaiba dun sa Baroque Catholicism that originated from Spain. And then the kind of Baroque Catholicism that was transported in the Philippines, no? So, but the, the main, uh, uh, one of the main chunk of uh, uh, understanding the Baroque Catholicism is uh, you know, the using of the senses, no? Perhaps others uh, from the panel here can correct me on that, no? So for Baroque Catholicism, the more lifelike, the better, no? Yung, yung the way you perform your devotion. So the, the use of the bodily, uh, of the body, you know, in the Baroque Catholicism is important, no? Because if you smell the incense, if you see the life-size images, uh, importante yon, no? So the, the the kind of Baroque Catholicism that was transported in the Philippines could have an element, no? That is a Mexican element. So, uh, but how the Filipinos reinterpreted it, no? Or uh, applied it, no? In their own understanding of Catholicism could be as different no and can be seen no in how contemporary events or contemporary religious understanding uh, what is happening in uh, the Philippines so remember no uh, yung sa Mexico yung the the blackness no sa image let's go to the image no the color black for the Mexican and Mexican American is totally different 
in a way, in the Filipino concept of blackness. No, kung sa Mexican is always related to the soil, soil. No, the Philippines is so-called power. Iba. So, but the symbolism is there. No, both reinterpreting the symbolism to another form and practice it. No. So many elements. No, it's only the trident catalyst is just one. No, because I'm arguing that there is an element, parin, no, of that that was inherited. Kaya nga yung inherited or not, it was then. And then nagkaroon lang siguro ng pagbabago when you know the 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 Vatican II appears. No, the question is, marami bang baga? You know, is there things in the Trident in catalysis in that was carried forward in the Vatican II or not, no? So, mayroong pagkakaiba. It's both an element that was inherited, no, from generation to generation until now, and then of course slightly different. Nagpagbabago because of the introduction, no. So, if there is concept Mexican catalysis in the Philippines, I have few lines, no, na sinabi ko dun sa isang project ko na. The concept of of what is that term? Something like that. No, later I will recall on that. No, there is a such a term in the Mexican religious understanding, local religious understanding, that was incorporated in in the Mexican Baroque. No, under Baroque. No, that's slightly similar to. The way Filipinos also understand the posadas, no. But I have to record it again, no, because I'm very fine. Pero ang gandun mo dun sa how I connect the Mexican Catholicism to the Philippine Filipino Catholicism, no. There is an element. Although yes, both Mexican and Philippines, maybe in Spanish, how Mexican Filipino reinterpreted. Catholicism, particularly, no, the inherited Tridentine Catholicism that uses the body and the senses to perform their popular devotion or devotion to particular God. Thank you, Dr. Taliara. For the interest of time, that is the last question. So we can answer, you can answer in the chat. Thank you. Salamat po. So now I will transfer uh, the uh, the for the second panel to uh, Professor uh, JJ. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Lovely discussion regarding Christianity in the Philippines. Okay, so I'm JJ Joaquin. So I'm from the philosophy department of De La Salle University. I'm also a research fellow at the Southeast Asian Research Research and Hub Research Center and Hub. Um, Okay, so this is the last panel for today's uh, conference. It's also on Christianity in the Philippines. So I'll introduce the two speakers now, and they are given 20 minutes for their presentations. Our first speaker is Dadilo Acosta Lumabas. He's from Felipe G. Calderon Integrated School, the Philippines. He'll talk about Pueblo Amante de Maria, the devotion of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the history of Valenzuela City. Our next speaker is from the University of Santo Tomas, Melanie I. Magpantay. Uh, she'll talk about Monsignor Gabriel M. Reyes, first Filipino Archbishop of Manila. Professor Lumabas. Good afternoon, po. Uh, good afternoon, uh, officers and members of Philippine Historical Association and attendees of the International Conference of the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation Southeast Asia. And I would like to thank uh, the Philippine Historical Association for this opportunity. Uh, allow me to share my PowerPoint presentation on one of my accounts here. Okay. 
Nakikita na po ba? Yes po, you can start now. Okay. Uh, thank you. So... Okay. So the title of my paper is Pueblo Amante de Maria, the devotion to the Virgin Mary in the history of Valenzuela City. So allow me to give you an introduction of my paper. Uh, last May 28, 2008, the steering committee of the Fatima Grand Marian Exhibit in Valenzuela City released its uh, souvenir program with a feature write-up tracing the history of Marian devotion in Valenzuela City with yours truly as the researcher and the writer. 12 years later and with many new discoveries surfaced, it is about time to retell the history of the people of Valenzuela's devotion to the Blessed Mother and to make also some revisions on some of the facts that was inscribed on that particular paper. So this paper will, uh, this paper aims to answer the following questions. So number one, how the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary developed within the Catholic faithful in Valenzuela City tracing its roots from the old town of Pulo. And number two, how the devotion of the Valenzuelanos or the people of Valenzuela to the Blessed Virgin Mary influential in the creation of the different parish parishes in Valenzuela City and eventually to the ecclesiastical history of the city. So as we all know, as Sir, as Sir Taliara pointed out earlier, Filipinos are known for their devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary and personally also as a Marian devotee. And in the city of Valenzuela, the devotion is known from parishes to the visitas or chapels to the lay devotees. This paper will try to trace back the origin. And from that, uh, from that research, I identified three periods of development of Marian devotion in this city, which I belong. So this research is indeed challenging, actually, because of the scarcity of documents pertaining to the topic itself. Since San Diego de Alcala Parish Church in Pulo, Valenzuela City was destroyed during the liberation period in 1945. It started with a simple curiosity on the part of, on the, part of the researcher way back 2008 on why the different parishes in Valenzuela City, their own patron saints as their Pintakasi, all celebrate the Feast of the Holy Rosary every October. This curiosity grew when the researcher uh, first encountered the antique images of Santo Rosario in the barangays Gente de Leon, Caruhatan, and Maysan, all of them showing striking similarities. Actually, the different papers that I've already presented before in Philippine Historic Association since 20, 2017 are all connected and, relate, and related with this paper that I'm about to present right now. So the research, uh, the, I, I conducted some research before since 2008, and it first started with an extensive interview with the elders and parishioners of Barangay Gente de Leon, Caruhatan, and Maysan that started in the year 2008, and with the elders and people from Barangay Pulo, Mapulang Lupa, and Ugong recently. The researcher also asked for copies of the history of the particular parish churches and examined plaques and markers among churches that tell, that tell their history and date of establishment. The researcher also consulted written records in the multimedia section of the National Library before it was uh, temporarily closed for in the late 2000s for rehabilitation purposes and scanned some records in the National Archives for possible accounts. And also the researcher uh, used some secondary sources such as books about the local history of Valenzuela City and Bulacan and some unpublished history of uh, particular churches, souvenir programs, and the like. So uh, in this paper, I would like to point out this particular framework that I devised that would discuss the, uh, the development of Marian devotion in Valenzuela City. Both and development of the devotion of the people of Valenzuela to the Blessed Virgin Mary can be traced back in the old town of Pulo, the old name of Valenzuela City with the areas of Poblacion, Pulo, Palasan, Coloong, Bisig, Tagalag, and the surrounding barangays as the centers of the town. So the, the different periods of development can be traced back into these different stages. So in this framework, we can see here three periods of development of Marian devotion in Valenzuela City. And I will call these ages according to their titles. 
the title uh, the age of immaculada conception the central nucleus of the uh, the framework the age of santo rosario and the age of fatima another developed nucleus in this particular uh, framework the two concentric circles of the immaculada conception and santo rosario age uh, periods all happened in the old town of Pulo, while a separate nucleus, the age of Fatima, was created. Allow me to discuss uh, these periods of development. So the first one is the Inmaculada Concepcion period that started upon the establishment of San Diego de Alcala Parish in 1623 until the 1900s. So by the time when Pulo was separated from its matrix, Mecawayan, in 1623, it was the Franciscans who tended the first the spiritual needs of the more than 7,000 of the new parochia or the parish that would encom uh, encompass the entire town of Pulo. The plan for the poblacion or, pobl or the town proper was developed and a new church was erected there. The parish church has San Diego de Alcala, a Franciscan as its patron saint. But in the historical data papers uh, that, I, that I read about Pulo, kept in the National Library, it is said that the church, after its repair in 1632, was dedicated to another patron saint, the Nuestra Señora de la Inmaculada Concepción. It's not actually surprising that the Franciscans have this kind of devotion to this particular title, the Blessed Virgin Mary. The devotion of the Franciscans to the Immaculate Conception, Immaculate Conception started long time ago. As you all know, St. Francis of Assisi had a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he actually composed a prayer to Our Lady. The Franciscan friar, Blessed John Scotus, provided an answer about the then confusing teachings of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Scotus solved the problem of the scholastic theologians by distinguishing between the order of nature and the order of time of the, of the title of the Immaculate Conception. In the order of nature, he said that Mary was a child of Adam before he was by sanctifying grace. But in the order of time, she was sanctified at the very moment her soul was created. Although Scotus' explanation was bitterly contested, especially by the Dominicans, it found official theological approval by the church. In 1483, Pope Sixtus uh, IV addressed the controversy surrounding the Immaculate Conception and gave Don Scotus' uh, conclusion in favor of the papal approval. So from this point onwards, most people devoutly celebrated the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and the theological controversy was put into rest. Four centuries later, Pope Pius IX would proclaim Don Scotus' explanation as an infallible truth through his papal bull on December 8, 1854 that the Blessed Virgin Mary, from the first moment of her conception, was preserved from any stain of original sin in virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ. I am explaining this uh, as a Catholic, of course, for the Catholic faith. The devotion of the people of the old town of Pulo to the Immaculate Conception was also manifested with the discovery of an image of Our Lady also depicted as, an, as the Immaculate Conception in the waters of Binwangan and was brought to Ubando Bulacan in the year 1763. This image, according to legend, being caught in a fish now called as Salambao is now popularly called Birheng na Salambao, or Nuestra Señora de Salambao. So on this old town where farming and fishing were the source of livelihood, that time in Pulo, the fate of the townspeople was tested during the heavy drought that happened in 1884, the, locus, uh, the pestilence of locusts in, in the farms of Pulo in 1832, and other, and other diseases that circulated around the old town of Pulo. So they devised, oh, say they, so they practiced this kind of, of of devotion, which we call now as the Lutrina. The Lutrina is a nightly devotion asking for rain, good harvest, or space, wherein an image of Our Lady was being born in a procession, circuiting the church vicinity as they pray the Holy Rosary or any devotional prayers. So this is the first period of the devotion of the, the Valenzuelanos to the Blessed Virgin Mary under the title of Immaculada Conception being introduced by the Franciscans. So as we can see now, there's a popular devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary under the title of Immaculate, Immaculate Conception and Nuestra Señora de Salamba, which is actually a depiction of the Immaculate Conception. 
So the second one, so we can see here the map of Pulo, we're in the old town of Pulo, which is situated around the vicinity of Pulo, Poblacion, uh, BC, Tagalog, Colong, and the like. We're, we're in the Poblacion itself is, the set, is considered as the center of the town. So uh, the second period of development is the Santa Rosa period. It started with the discovery of the Colong image and the revitalization of the devotion to Our Lady. So uh, though a town established by the Franciscans as, and as their own title of devotion to Our Lady, a strong devotion to the Santo Rosario started at the turn of the 19th century with the discovery of the image of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary among the mangroves of the Barangay Coloong during the Spanish period, during the late Spanish period to be particular. The image, which you can see now at the uh, TV, uh, the monitor, is a painting actually measuring 13 by 10.5 inches. It greatly resembles the image of Our Lady of Pompeii, only that Our Lady sits on a pile of clouds, with Saint Dominic reaching the rosary from Our Lady's hand, while Saint Francis the same on the other side. A dog can be seen under Our Lady holding an orb in a torch between its teeth, which is a famous attribute to Saint Dominic. So according to the story, uh, one day during the late 1800s, a heavy downpour lasted for days, which we call, we Filipinos call it a siam siam, that made Koloong submerged in, in flood. At nightfall, a resident of Koloong then heard someone singing the Ave Maria. The, the voice recurred for many days, even after the uh, evening oration. Curiosity led this woman into the swamps of Koloong following the mysterious voice, and there tangled within the mangrove roots she saw the painted image of Santo Rosario. The woman quickly rescued the image and brought it into her home and started the first miracle. News quickly spread among the neighborhood, which prompted them to build a small chapel that of touch nipa and bamboo. So upon the discovery and the introduction of the devotion to the Santo Rosario on the following years, a unique devotion called Taluki flourished in Pulo. Taluki actually, which I presented before in 2017, is the daily recitation of the Holy Rosary accompanied with series of prayers, songs, and reflections during the entire month of, entire month of October, following the prayer indicated in the book Mes de Octubre by Father Jose Maria Moran O.P. Due to security reasons, two replicas of the Colón image were commissioned and served as the Black Rosary images that go house to house within the confines of Colón. In San Diego de Alcala Parish, a wooden image of Santo Rosario was commissioned and her feast was celebrated in the month of October. So upon the, the discovery of the Coloong image, this, the Santo Rosario image found in Coloong, the devotion to the Santo Rosario flourished in the old town of Pulo, prompting the parish to declare the Nuestra Señora del Rosario as the segunda patrona of the parish, replacing the title of Inmaculada Concepcion previously introduced by the Franciscans. No existing records, unfortunately, were found whether there is a formal declaration of the patronato of the Santo Rosario. As you all know, due to the fact that San, San Diego de Alcala Parish in Pulo was one of the casualties of the war. But extant photos show that as early as 1920s, the image of Santo Rosario was already enshrined and being propagated by the faithful at the main altar of Pulo. It can be concluded that this action happened after the last Franciscan friar who administered the parish in Pulo. Padre Alcantara Flores, Padre Pedro Alcantara Flores, OFM, who fostered the propagation to the Inmaculada Concepcion. And upon the adv advent of the Filipino diocesan prelates, prelates who introduced the devotion to the Santo Rosario. So from the in, uh, simple outward expression of devotion, said Virgin Mary, lay people started to organize themselves to show solidarity and led people to the different devotions to Our Lady. So in Pulo, the Ijas de Maria, one of the oldest Marian oriented organizations in Pulo, was established, composed of women devotees of the Blessed Mother. They had their first election in 1919 with Aurora Agustines as its first president and, followed, and was followed by Petronila Santiago, Placida Herrera, Antonia Bartolome, Aurela Venezuela, and the like. And of course, during this period, one of, the, uh, one of those famous uh, personalities in Pulo before, um, Mang Severo Hermoso, 
become famous for sponsoring images of saints and of the Blessed Virgin Mary for the church and of those who were included in the procession during the Holy Week. So this started now the, uh, the revitalization of the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary under the title of Santo Rosario. So now when the people in Valenzuela are now starting to great within the confines of the city and the population of Valenzuela started to swell, uh, the parish church in Pulo started to, uh, uh, to disseminate the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The parish itself, the parish of San Diego de Alcala, established chapels called Tuklong in these areas, as you can see in the map, as, as they attend to their spiritual needs. These Tuklongs or chapels were also venues of monthly Holy Rosary done in these places. This, uh, the parish brought to these barangays the devotion to the Our Lady of a Holy Rosary. Afterwards, the faithful of these barangays commissioned their own images of Santo Rosario. As of today, as I have uh, as of this writing, and as, as I was speak speaking today, there are four existing images of Santo Rosario in Valenzuela City, all have striking similarities, and that can they trace themselves at the beginning before the war. You have five minutes left. Thank you, sir. So we, we have here the Nuestra Señor del Rosario de Maizan, of the Santo Rosario of Caruhatan, the Santo Rosario of Mapulan Lupa, and, and Santo Rosario of Torres Bugallon, now Genti de Leon. So aside from Taluki, residents of the old, Caru old town of Caruhatan performed the Lutrina as well as in Pulo, in, in Pulo and in uh, Ugong. Also written in the old documents of Ugong was that there was already established devotion to Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. So as you can see now, these particular places of worship, the Tuklong, in these four barangays of Karohatan, Maisan, Gente de Leon, and Mapulang Lupa will serve as a crucial uh, centers of, develop of, of devotion to the Santo Rosario that would eventually lead them to the establishment of separate parish churches here in Valenzuela City. So we have already established now the second uh, period of uh, development in to the Blessed Virgin Mary, which is the period of Santo Rosario. The third one, which is the Fatima period, the new center of fat of Marian devotion in Valenzuela City. Actually, uh, after the after, there was a time in the history of Valenzuela City that it was split into two separate towns. The old town of Pool on the northern half, as you can see at the, at the monitor, and the new town of Valenzuela on the southern half that happened on July 21, 1960. And after the splitting the, of Pulo, a new parish church was created on March 7, 1961, the parish of Our Lady of Fatima, and it was created by then Rufino J. Cardinal Santos and assigned Monsignor Espiritu Ison as its first parish priest. We must uh, take into consideration that the new parish of Our Lady of Fatima encompasses the new town of Valenzuela. And we should also take note that this new particular parish church is, was, was not of the four uh, Tuklong or chapel that was established before by the San Diego de Alcala Parish. So since its declaration as the National Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in June 12, 1976, many important citywide diocesan and national Marian events took place at this place since the arrival of the National Pilgrim Image of Our Lady of Fatima in the National Shrine in October 1999. The particular image, the, the, the National Pilgrim Image was present uh, during the Pe Edsa People Power Revolution in 2001, the wake of President Corazon Aquino and the like. The shrine also was the venue of the first diocesan Marian celebration in January 5, 2008, and also the venue of the solemn consecration of the Philippines to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, initiated by the uh, Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines last May 13, 2020. The image of Our Lady Fatima was granted the Episcopal coronation by the Diocese of Malolos, while the city council through the ordinance number 16 series of 2011 declared Our Lady of Fatima as the patroness of Valenzuela City. So this actually serves as the paramount act in the part of the church and secular government in recognition to a popular modern devotion in Valenzuela City. So as we can see now, because of the splitting of Pulo and its event, eventual reunification, Aside from the influx of people in outside of Valenzuela to settle in the southern part of Valenzuela City, 
and the transfer of the municipal building from Pulo to Malinta led to the increase of number of population in this particular part of Venezuela, the southern part, and its gradual polarization of the political center of the town, shifting its weight from Pulo Poblacion area to the southern part of the city. This also led to the, to the successive creation of parish churches in the southern part of Venezuela. So from this Tuklong, they became the Our Lady of the Holy Rosary Parish in Maisan, Holy Cross Church in Gente de Leon, the Holy Family Parish Church in Caruhatan, and San Juan de la Cruz Parish in Ugong. Also, two, two minutes left. Thank you, po, sir. And also within Valenzuela City, during the reinvigoration of the devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, various Marian organizations established also in this part of Valenzuela. The oldest existing presidium of, uh, of the Legion of Mary, the Ababanal Abab Narena, and the Blue Army, now World Apostolate of Fatima in Valenzuela City, started here and actually continues up to this day. So aside from these places of worship, there are also chapels were, uh, that were built in other parts of Valenzuela City, particularly in Sitio Bitic in Gente de Leon, and the Santo Rosario chapels in Barangay Vente Reales and San Simon in Malinta. So also, all devotional practices according to the Mother of God was developed. So from Taluki, uh, it was developed into Black Rosary groups. From Lutrina, processional, uh, non penitential processions actually started by the National Shrine of Our Lady of Fatima in the 1970s, first intended as a supplication to heaven for the speedy construction of the parish church that was then under construction. So to conclude my paper, so from the painted image of Santo Rosario in the swamp area of Coloong to the Episcopally crowned Our Lady of Fatima, the people of Valenzuela have made the devotion to Our Lady not only a part of their human psyche, but also developed the history of this town and helped bound the Poblacion, the old town of Poblacion, and the outskirts of the old town of Pulo because of this particular devotion. So this research uh, hopes to be a contributory factor in the creation of the religious and ecclesiastical history of Valenzuela City, which the researcher hopes to make and create in the future. And as we close this month, this month of October, dedicated to Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, may, may we Valenzuelanos, or the people of Valenzuela, always recall in this where Our Lady manifested her maternal care to us people of Valenzuela and always pray the rosary. Our Lady of the Holy Rosary, pray for us. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Lumabas. Our next speaker is Melanie Magpantay. Please share your screen now. May I ask the other presenters that can please stop sharing the screen? Thank you. 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 Uh, yeah, but please speak louder, Miss Melanie, because we can't hear it. Yeah, can you hear me louder now? Yes, thanks. Good afternoon, I am Melanie Magpantay, and I'm inviting you to watch out for the December 2020 issue of Talakasaysayan, an online journal of history. For more information, please log on to www.talakasaysayan.org. If you enter the Manila Cathedral main entrance and you proceed to the left side facing the altar, you will see this listing of the Archbishops of Manila since the time of the Diocese of Manila was established on 1579. It is a complete listing of the 32 Archbishops of Manila, 27 are foreign Archbishops, and only five native or Filipino Archbishops who form. The first Filipino Archbishop of Manila is Monsignor Gabriel M. Reyes, who shepherded the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Manila from 1949 to 1952. Gabriel M. Reyes was ordained priest on 1915, and he became the second Filipino bishop of Cebu on October 1932. Upon the elevation of the archdiocese of the Diocese of Cebu into an archbishopric on 1934, he also became its first archbishop. And concurrently, he was the first Filipino archbishop of the Philippines. It was possible for a late to be appointed to be a 
archbishop or a bishop because during this time, the 1917 Pio Benedictine Code of Canon Law was in force. Canons 329 to 362 discusses and specifies the qualifications of a bishop or an archbishop and also the process of the nomination of the bishop or an archbishop. Nowhere in these canons does it specify that there should be a racial requirement nor the opinion of secular politicians or secular leaders should be taken into consideration. It was the Pope and only the Pope who can decide on who will be the bishop or an archbishop in all of the dioceses and archdioceses of the world. The 1917 Pio Benedictine Code was also enforced during the time of Archbishop Michael O'Doherty. is the first Arch Irish Archbishop of Manila, the longest serving Archbishop, and the last foreign Archbishop of Manila who was bedridden by 1949. By September 1949, it became clear that he cannot perform his episcopal functions. So according to canon law or according to the 1917 Pio Benedictine Code, if the sitting Archbishop is incapacitated, two things may happen. First, an apostolic administrator said the plena is appointed or a co-adjutor with future succession, succession is appointed. Canon 351 paragraph 2 states that, and I quote, unless otherwise pro uh, provided otherwise in these letters, a co-adjutor who is given to a bishop who is entirely incapacitated has all his full rights and duties. Otherwise, he has only those that the bishop commits to him. As I've said earlier, towards the end of September 1949, Archbishop Michael O'Doherty cannot perform his episcopal functions. That is why the apostolic delegate of the Philippines, Egidio Bagnosi, issued an apostolic decree on September 28, 1949, appointing Gabriel M. Reyes as the co-adjutor said the plena of the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Seat of Manila. Anaklanon became the primate of the Philippines. Banyosi also provided Gabriel M. Reyes the title of Bishop of Puli, the right to succeed Archbishop Michael O'Doherty and the faculty of a resident bishop. He also became the apostolic administrator of the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Manila. The day after, on September 29, 1949, on the Feast of the Archangels and also the feast day of Michael O'Doherty, a native was installed as the Archbishop of Manila at the San Miguel Pro Cathedral. Auxiliary Bishop of Manila, Rufino Santos, called this a new chapter in the history of the Catholic Church in the Philippines. And he even called Gabriel M. Reyes a beacon that emerges from the hierarchy. On screen, you will see the person standing and wearing the bishop's mitre, Gabriel M. Reyes, giving his first blessing as the co-adjutor Archbishop of Manila. The news of the appointment of Gabriel M. Reyes was well received in social circles. The Sentinel called his appointment as God sent. Manila Times said that the whole Filipino family, the whole Filipino nation rejoices. And Manila Bulletin uh, listed all these dignitaries who congratulated Archbishop Reyes. And the general public, they sent readings via newspaper advertisements. So much so that the September 25, 1949 issue of the Sentinel published all of these newspaper advertisements coming from businesses, Catholic schools, and also religious congregations that congratulated the, uh, Gabriel M. Reyes on his appointment. The warm response of the lady can be analyzed or it can be understood by looking onto this table. This is a listing or statistical listing of the Filipino and foreign archbishops of Manila taken from the 1952 Catholic Directive. From this table, we can see that in the ecclesiastical provinces of the Philippines, only the Archdiocese of Cagayan remained with a foreign archbishop by the name of Reverend, pa Reverend Monsignor James T.G. Hayes of the Archdiocese of Cagayan. Had it not been for Gabriel M. Reyes' appointment, Manila and Cagayan will remain with foreign archbishops. The native, by 1952, the native appointments to higher ecclesiastical offices is almost complete. We will proceed with the discussion of the three-year stewardship of Archbishop Reyes using the theory of Arnold Toynbee's challenge and response. Basically, challenge and response uh, narrates, says that there are challenges that a society, a civilization, or an institution encounters throughout its existence. And based on the responses of the institution, the civilization, uh, as it, we can analyze its growth or decline. Point B also said that these responses are led by certain creative personalities. And in this study, we selected or we pinpointed Archbishop Reyes as that creative personality who led the responses to, to the challenges. 
and helping the creative personality is the creative minority, the lady who move towards the, arch, the archbishop's vision. Both of the definitions of the creative personality and creative minorities were taken from the study of Arnold Toynbee, a study of history. The first challenge that Archbishop Reyes encountered as a creative personality that shepherded the Archdiocese of Manila is the large territory of the Archdiocese, spanning 5,783 square kilometers with 2,200,315 inhabitants. 82% of these are Catholics. Politically, it covers the city of Manila and the provinces of Bulacan, Cavite, and Rizal. You can see on screen on your left a, the parts in red that are on the map. That is the territory of the Archdiocese of Manila on 1952. But I had to apologize because I took a contemporary map, but I can, even quarantine restrictions, I can find the, a 1949 map. Archbishop Reyes responded to this challenge by creating smaller parishes and revamping the vicar gates and appointing new vicar forains. Vicar gates are clusters of parishes that are led by vicar forains. Vicar forains uh, ensure that all of the parishes are, uh, are their spiritual and temporal needs are met, according to the vision of the Archbishop. So on 1951, Archbishop Reyes uh, divided uh, the archdiocese into these into this vicar gates. Manila had two vicar gates, Bulacan six, Cavite three, Rizal five, for a total of 16 vicar gates. And the total number of parishes on 1951 was 126. Meanwhile, the second uh, challenge that Archbishop Reyes encountered is the challenge of communism. So for Archbishop Reyes, the ideals of communism are very attractive for the youth and when they are attracted to these ideas, they also tend to embrace the idea of a dissent. So he would want that there should be a rigorous religious instruction. But religious instruction during this time was limited into the private Catholic schools, public schools who offer the optional catechetical instruction and to the parish catechism classes. In order for rigorous religious instruction to occur, he established the Victorial Catechetical Institute for the formal training of catechists. But it is important to remember that the full implementation of this institute, meaning there were graduates, were over, over, overseen by the next Archbishop of Venus. Another challenge that Archbishop Reyes encountered is the strengthening of the Catholic Action Movement. Essentially, this, the Catholic Action Movement is a legacy of Archbishop Odo Herti. So during uh, the Archbishop Reyes' time, there were 25 to 28 different Catholic action groups that had different activities but are moving towards, should be moving towards one aim, which is to combat immorality and communism. And in order to streamline its activities and have a united front against these perceived uh, enemies of the church, Archbishop Reyes created the Catholic Action Central Board and its Archdiocese and equivalent, the Archdiocese and Central Committee for Catholic Action. And in order for the church hierarchy to direct how the Catholic Action Movement will proceed, Archbishop Reyes established the Episcopal Commission on Catholic Action. We must remember that when we speak of challenge and response and the creative personality, it is not only the creative personality who should be responding, but also the creative minority. In this case, the lady interpreted these responses of Archbishop Reyes as challenges for them. So much so that they responded, they reacted to the responses of Archbishop Reyes. They participated actively, especially among prominent personalities. Case in point is the Student Catholic Action Catechism classes of Manila, Pasay, and Quezon City on 1952 that had 3,000 volunteers in 60 public elementary schools to avail the catechism classes. And it had a total no estimated total number of beneficiaries of 150,000. And by prominent personality, on, during the time of Archbishop Reyes so far, it was Attorney Raul Manglapus who was very, very active in the Catholic Action Movement. He was the president of the Archdiocese and Committee on Catholic Action. So this is a challenge of, for Archbishop Reyes that is still a challenge among bishops and archbishops of the Philippines today, which is the lack of priests. And during his time, the diocese and seminarians do not have a permanent home. They were sharing a home with the Colegio de San Jose. So his response was to construct a permanent building for the diocese and seminary at a cost of 2,300,000. It was designed by architect Juan Nakpil of Nakpil and Company. It had 75 major uh, quarters for 75 major seminarians. 
dormitories for 100 final seminarians at chapel and an auditorium. So again, the lady reacted to these responses of the Archbishop, treating it as a challenge for them, especially among the male uh, lady. They continued to enroll to the diocesan seminary, especially the minor seminary program. The Catholic Directory for 1952 uh, tallies that Seminario Conciliar de San Carlos had 70 enrollees, and this is far greater than the enrollees of UST Semi Central Seminary at 6 and the Jesuit Ran Colegio de San Jose at 53. So perhaps the best known challenge that Archbishop Reyes encountered is the required reading of Rafael Palma's The Pride of Malay Race for second year public high school students on 1950. So the Pride of Malay Race is a Rizal biography that disputes the veracity of the Rizal retraction document that was found in the Archdiocese and Archives. Of course, the Catholic Church did not agree with this argument, so much so that Archbishop Reyes issued a pastoral statement that banned the reading, keeping, or maintaining a copy of the Pride of Malay Race in its original Spanish or translated English copy. If you do so, you are in a state of sin. So again, the lady uh, interpreted this as a challenge for them, especially among the youth and the students who lobbied to politicians without prodding from the Archbishop. So the largest rally was done Five minutes more. inside USD on February 4, 1950. So the vice president of the Philippines was there, and he was forced to meet the rallyists, and the rallyists gave their memorial petition, forcing Department of Justice Secretary Ricardo Nepomuceno to reopen the case of the Palma Book approval, and of course, it was a victory for the uh, another challenge that Archbishop Reyes encountered is how he will expand the role of a bishop from being exclusively concerned to spiritual matters to that of shepherding the faithful so that the faithful will fulfill their role for their civic duties. For example, during the 1949 presidential elections, Archbishop Reyes issued the pastoral statement on the sacredness of the ballot. So on the sacredness of the ballot is a five-point guide for Catholic voters on how they can choose their candidate. And this was published by the Sentinel on November 6, 1949. The full version is on screen. The last paragraph I like to highlight because it was important then, it's still important now. As citizens of a democracy, we are the instruments and channels through which authority flows from the hands of God into the hands of our elected leaders. Unless we are free, intelligent, vigilant instruments and channels, how can we hope to have a great nation, a Christian people, a Catholic bulwark against the imminent threat of communism. I most earnestly recommend to all concerned to so act that this election will, in all reality, be a truly honest and clean election. Notice that this is an archbishop, uh, well, particularly, of course, he is a very senior archbishop who published the pastoral statement in English. And he was he published this in English because he was responding to the challenge of communicating his message to the people not only using English, but also using the press, in particular, the Catholic press. He was a, a supporter of the Sentinel, who became a Catholic, uh, official Catholic organ during, the, during his stewardship. And I think during the until the 1970s, when it stopped publication. So again, the lady interpreted this as a challenge for them. So instead of just using the Catholic uh, printing press, the Catholic lady actually expanded evangelization using the radio. In particular, on Saturdays, there is a 30-minute radio program in DZS or DC Santo Tomas. Uh, it is described as uh, the voice of Catholic Philippines. So every Saturday from 7 o'clock to 7.30 is the Catholic Press Hour. It's a 30-minute program that covers the news of the week and then gives a Catholic uh, perspective and Catholic commentaries for all of these news. From all of this, you see, that the Catholic faithful of Manila responded to the appointment of a Filipino archbishop in two ways, by cooperating with diocesan activities, and they moved towards upholding the Catholic identity. And they would have continued to do so had it not been for the untimely death of Gabriel M. Reyes on October 10, 1952. He was laid to rest at the San Miguel Pro Cathedral on October 24, 1950. After three years of shepherding the Archdiocese of Manila, Yes, the world saw that he as a Filipino can lead an archbishopric. It was a timely appointment, four years after the independence of the Philippines, that it signaled the coming to full maturity of the Christian civilization in Asia. 
This is the story of Gabriel M. Reyes, the first Filipino Archbishop of Manila. Maraming salamat po. Viva Historia. Thank you, Ms. Melanie, for that wonderful talk. So if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A box or the chat box. Uh, Mr. Lumabos, can you open your video so that we can start the Q&A? So there are some questions in the Q&A box now. So I'll just, this is from uh, Sir Victoris and to Melanie. So do you have any information on Gabriel Reyes's role during World War II? when some of the hierarchy collaborated with the Japanese? And how did Gabriel Reyes support the Filipinization of the religious orders in the period after the war? For the role of Gabriel M. Reyes during World War II, I would have to resort to a biography of uh, Gabriel M. Reyes, which is uh, entitled Gentle Shepherd Faithful Sentinel. It was authored by Evelyn uh, Tirol. Basically, I can't discuss it now because it covered the years when he was the Archbishop of Cebu. But we can discuss it later, privately, sir. And as for the second question on promoting the, I think you're pertaining to the Filipinization movement of the Catholic Church. Since he was the first Filipino Archbishop, he was actually the first Archbishop, as I've said earlier, to expand the role of being an Archbishop before, before they, the archbishops were solely concerned on spiritual matters because it was the church teaching at the time. And he was actually the first one to react and issue a pastoral statement that will encourage the Filipino Catholic voters to do their civic duty. That's why on sacredness of the ballot is a very important thing. Okay. Thank you, Melanie. So there's a, a hand raised from Janet Atutubo. Miss Janet, please unmute your mic. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So please raise your question. Uh, what was the role of the Archbishop with regards to the Filipino uh, religious congregations? Because before that, they were not, uh, how do you call it? They were not acknowledged by the Catholic Church. But I think after the war, uh, the Filipino Archbishop uh, were the ones who led in the movement, especially in Rome, in recognizing the, uh, the role of the Filipino uh, congregation. So what did the bishop do in relation to that? Thank you. For the role of the Filipino Archbishop, I think we have to redirect again to the 1917 Pio Benedictine because there is no racial requirement in so far as religious congregations are concerned. But the thing is, when we speak of religious congregations, we should also be examining their, the, the internal rules of each, each of these religious organizations. Uh, the bishops does not have a say on how they should run their own organization because they are completely different uh, entities then and now. But the thing is, as I've said, there are no racial requirements as so far as religious, uh, religious congregations are concerned. But the thing is, the Archbishop of Manila, uh, Gabriel M. Reyes, it was, uh, his stewardship was very, very short to analyze what was his stand during uh, his time. If we are pertaining to the post-war Filipinization movement among the Catholic Church, we'd have to look into either Rufino Santos, yeah, Rufino Santos, because he was the one uh, during the 60s. Okay, so thank you. There's another question from Sir Jeric Albelia. So this is a question for Ms. Pantay once again. Magpantay. Upon the death of Archbishop Reyes, was he considered to be elevated as cardinal? Uh, actually, 
President Quirino considered him a future cardinal had it not been for his early death. He was, uh, remember, he was the first Filipino Archbishop of the Philippines and the first Filipino to be elevated into the Metropolitan See. That's why it's, he is called the Primate of the Philippines. He was the Archbishop of Manila during his first year and concurrently, he was the Apostolic Administrator of Cebu. So the territory that he was uh, managing at that time was very big. Two archdioceses, the two biggest in the Philippines. He would have been a cardinal had it not been for his failing health. Thank you, Miss Melanie. So are there any more questions? I'm still waiting for some questions. I have a question for uh, Professor Lumabas. So I am from Obando, Bulacan as well. So I'm really interested in your study in the Valenzuela um, devotion to Mary. But what's the relationship between, you know, the, the Obando chapter of Nuestra Señora de Salambao and what's going on in Valenzuela? Uh, to be honest, uh, the, the, the devotion to Our Lady of Salambao in, in Obando, Bulacan, is somewhat somehow related to the devotion to the Immaculada Conception of Ulo Bulacan. The Franciscans introduced the, the devotion to the Immaculate Conception, and one of and the, actually the Nuestra Señora de Salambo is actually a depiction, depiction of the in of the Immaculate Conception. And basically, uh, Ulo and Obando shares uh, share some 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 particular de devotional practices like like what's happening in San Roque in Mabulo and also the Casilunawan festival in uh, Casilunawan fertility rites a uh, fertility dance in Ubando Bulacan uh, and also the, the 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 devotion the attachment of the of the people of Venezuela to Ubando to the Blessed Virgin Mary is somehow related and somehow uh, attached to each other yeah, thanks very much, Mr. Lomabas. Actually, I'm very much interested there because the connection between Obando and Polo, Valenzuela is just one kilometer away. We're neighbors, basically, right? Yes, actually, <laughs> it's just a straight away the, from, uh, from Parayansilo Villa to Obando. Right. So that's very interesting. And your feast in our feast, our fiesta, yes. is May. And your fiesta as well is are there any more questions from the group? I think we still have time for some questions. If you have questions, please do type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, so thanks. Let's thank our speakers, Melanie Magpantay and Delino Acosta Lumabas for their great work in this last session of the panel. I'll turn you over to Xiao Chua for, the, for our last activity. Thanks. Makasaysayang hapon po muli sa ating lahat. Marami pong salamat at uh, uh, tinapos po ninyo ang ating konferensya the International Conference of the Philippine Historical Association and the International Council for Historical and Cultural Cooperation Southeast Asia. Arrivals, Conflict, and Transformation in Maritime Southeast Asia, 1400 to 1800. Of course, again, this is brought to you by the Philippine Historical Association, Masyarakat Sejawaran Indonesia, Persatuan Sejara Malaysia, the National Quincentennial Committee, the De La Salle University Southeast Asia Research Center and Hub, and the University of San Carlos. I would now like to call to give us closing remarks and synthesis of the third day. I'm honored to recognize the president of the Philippine Historical Association, Dr. Maria Luisa T. Camagre. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, let me give, it's a big job. I am uh, made 
to handle because I'm supposed to synthesize all the papers from day one up to today. But uh, it's with pleasure that I do this uh, task. Okay. Let me read um, uh, a synthesis of uh, the conference. The talk of Farish Noor set the tone of the conference. When he asserted that Southeast Asian history is part of global history. By decentering the colonial power in the history of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asians are now becoming the dominant voice in their historical narratives instead of the colonial power. This effort of, uh, is not to marginalize the European narratives, but in, to include the Asian narrative in the retelling of the history of the world. Dr. Noor mentioned how Southeast Asians before the coming of the Europeans were in contact with one another, but that colonialism separated us from each other. It is now time, according to Dr. Noor, that we start reconnecting with one another. Dr. Noor mentioned that much as we are victims of the imperial past, which we cannot- German ambassador. Our task is to decolonize our knowledge of the past and to realize that our history is world history as well. Now, uh, I categorize the papers according to the following. One category of uh, papers I can subsume under uh, Magellan Elcano expedition. So part of this category will be the paper on the site of the first mass. Second, the Palawan landfall. Third would be food of the Spanish Armada. Fourth will be the film depictions of Lapu Lapu. Uh, which uh, was uh, done uh, this uh, today. Then the instructional materials produced by NQC and NHCP. Uh, so I think uh, that will cover that particular category of the Magellan Elcano expedition. So I encourage you just like Shao uh, has in, been encouraging you to make use of the um, uh, visual aids, the instructional materials that uh, the NQC and NHCP have been uh, busy producing. The second category of papers touched on sources. We know that in history, we have to have sources. So there was one category of source would be the maps, which I'm bit, uh, uh, elucidated. Then we have also Jawa, Jawi scripts uh, uh, mentioned in the paper of uh, uh, Ariel. Uh, then you also have the uh, kind of uh, primary source of letters uh, by Ahmad the American. Um, and fourth will be the treatise of the VOC. So uh, I think the, those papers were all uh, towards uh, pointing to us the importance of primary sources in their various forms. The third category I realized was something about trade. And the trade, according to uh, the papers that were read, uh, brought about Islamization in Java, uh, trade ties between Malacca and Muluka, uh, maritime routes, and Philippine trade with China and Japan. My fourth, the fourth category was on local history. And under this category would be found the papers on the Linao uprising, the maritime trading in the Visayan Islands, the pre-Hispanic maritime trade, the Ilagas of South Cotabato, the industry of uh, Industria Nanyog, Los Baños, the local elections in San Pablo, and the uh, Lantacas. I think this particular aspect should encourage more uh, research, the technological aspect you know, of um, pre-colonial uh, uh, Southeast Asia. 
the last category would be Christianity in the Philippines. And uh, we had all the very interesting papers read on the evangelization of the Philippines, according to Pigafetta, the devotion to the Jesus Nazareno, devotion to the Virgin Mary, and Gabriel Reyes. I was uh, surprised to um, know from the paper reader that uh, Palma's book on the pride of the Malay race was, uh, was uh, sort of banned by uh, Archbishop uh, Gabriel Reyes. But I know the context of this all will be because of the 1950s witch hunting and communist threat, et cetera, the Cold War. Now, my comments. For the past three days, we have had a bountiful harvest of scholarly papers. And I invite you to, um, you know, uh, submit re or rewrite your papers and submit them to our journal, the Historical Bulletin. Uh, this is the journal of the Philippine Historical Association. So that your papers uh, will not just be lying there on your desk, but uh, have it um, shared, you share it with us. Uh, second, you know, I'm so elated and so happy that there's so many young uh, scholars uh, in history. And um, I'm so happy <laughs> to see young people reading papers. No? And uh, uh, I hope you take advantage of the many platforms that are available to test your ideas, to share your ideas. Uh, and uh, to publish them. So I'm so, so happy. And uh, I, will, I will conclude that the discipline of history is not going to die and is in good hands. Okay, the third uh, observation I uh, would like to make is that uh, I'm also uh, happy that the conference pushed through uh, at the start of uh, this lockdown in March, we already decided, okay, we will not pursue it. But um, in one of our meetings, the board meetings, uh, there was uh, the decision that uh, it should push through in whatever format, but the webinar was the best uh, suggested manner of reaching out and uh, uh, making this conference possible. So uh, I think um, we are not sure of next year how things will be, but uh, we should not be um, discouraged. And I hope that uh, we will still have a conference, whether webinar or really physically present. But uh, I found personally that the three days was not taxing at all. I didn't get tired. Uh, I was so happy because you're, you, you get so much information in the confines of your home. So I would like to end by thanking people. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank the plenary speakers for their time and expertise, uh, as well as the paper readers. Thank you for uh, uh, presenting your papers to us. I'd like also to thank the National uh, Quincentennial Commission, the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, the uh, Society of Indonesian Historians, the Malaysian Historical Society, the DLSU Southeast Asian Research Center and its hub, the University of San Carlos. We wanted the conference to be held in San Carlos, but um, because of the pandemic, we were constrained to have it here in Manila via webinar. I'd like also to thank the PHA officers, uh, Fernie for being the convenor, Xiao for uh, the resolution and uh, being part of this uh, program, uh, Glo uh, Melencio, Rohane, uh, Wensley, uh, uh, Arlene, Dobal, all of you, thank you very much. And last but not the least, 
uh, you participants. Thank you for staying with us for three days. It was, well, uh, I really feel that it was really a very pleasant experience for me. So I hope it was so also for you. Thank you and see you next year again. Thank you. Thank you very much also for taking the helm of the Philippine Historical Association, Dr. Maria Luisa Picamane, Ma'am Malu. Salamat po. And that is why, you know, I, I just want to say that I hope that this conference of the International Cooperation and the PHA demonstrated the power of history. For many Filipino scholars and for many of you who watched as Filipinos, it's like coming home to Southeast Asia. A land, a culture that we're not so familiar because of colonization, but now getting to know this as part of our own as well. The power of history also to unite the scholars and the peoples of Southeast Asia to feel that they're really connected. And we are only able to do this because of history. That's why I hope that history will always be an important part of our lives as a people and as a nation. This has been Shao Chua for the Philippine Historical Association. We are now closing the conference. Marami pong salamat at mabuhay tayong lahat. Good day to everyone. We'd like to invite the officers of the association, the trustees and the board to please open your cameras for some a photo opportunity. And please keep safe from the storm. Sir Fernie? Yeah. Can you make bilang? Yeah, uh, I'm just waiting for the others to turn on their cameras. Si Rohani. Rohani. Honey. Disable ako. Ah, wait, wait ma'am. Are you enabled now? See, yeah, we'll, we'll take the picture now. All right. One, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Guys, it's a pleasure working with all of you. Salamat po. Sir Fernie, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Salamat. 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 Bye.